be debated over various retina fora all around the country. Uh, retina practice guidelines in the COVID-19 era. We have an array of experienced and very eminent retina specialists to hold forth on this. Uh, Dr. Manisha Agarwal, head of retina services at the Shop Charity Eye Center, uh, has helped design this program and will be helping me moderate this program as we go along. And I'd uh, request uh, Manisha to introduce our August panel for today. Manisha. Thank you, Anand, and good evening to everyone. So without wasting any time, I would be introducing the August panel that we have today. Uh, first is Dr. Cyrus Shroff, who's the director of Shroff Eye Center from New Delhi. We have Dr. Giridhar. I think he would be joining us a little later from Giridhar Eye Institute, Cochin. We have Professor Vishali Gupta, who is a senior professor from PGI Chandigarh and also the president of UVA Society of India. We have Dr. Prashant Bhavankule from Sarakshi Netrale Nagpur and also is the joint treasurer of VRSI. We have with us Dr. N.S. Murlidhar also as one of the speakers and who is the vice president of VRSI. I would last introduce Dr. Shobit Chavla, who is the president of VRSI and director of Prakash Netrakendra from Lucknow. Over to Shobit, sir, please. Thank you very much, Manisha. Uh, this is second in the series of the VRSI webinars. The first one was well received, which was on ocular imaging. Today we are going to speak about the practices in the COVID era in uh, vitreoretinal retinal surgery. I now invite Professor Atul Kumar, who besides being chief of the RP center, is also advisor to the government for national uh, program for prevention of blindness and the ministry for health and fam family welfare uh, to start his first deliberation. Thank you, Atul. Yes. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, VRSA, for including me in your very prestigious uh, this VRSA uh, mere, uh, discussion webinar because we're going to lay down actually the very major uh, guidelines which will add, uh, add on as a, an extra or probably to the already existing AS guidelines. So uh, it would be good from various subspecialities we have thrown. Because they know we know exactly what is required and what is you know maybe superfluous in the case of retina, retina case. So I'm going to tell you what the electrical emergency surgeries and uh, what are the ones with electrical emergency and what kind of uh, should be important and uh, what else is important in such cases when they come to us for presumably for surgery. But somebody mentioned there's a new normal. So yes, there is a new normal and I have to adapt to it and uh, with hope with time that things will settle down but the second wave could not be pandemic wave that's what one people uh, people say because there, there will be a certain amount of immunity so it'll be more of a asymptomatic wave with very few cases who have not been affected before infected before and who have poor immunity to be affected so the second wave is not going to be as drastic it'll be very less so don't be so pessimistic about it it's going to be a very mild if at all in fact, many patients, persons will go asymptomatic. And soon as herd immunity comes in, we will find that many of us are just like BCG positive. We will also be probably after the flu in just shots, we will also be COVID positive. So that's what we are waiting for. And let's be a little optimistic about this disease. This is a flu virus. The only thing is new virus and just introducing to all of us and the, mainly the audience. Uh, we all know about it. So it's the natural, natural reservoirs and bats. Bats are very high immune system and unfortunately they carry a, uh, thousands and thousands of millions of uh, very virulent viruses. But because of the extreme high degree of immunity, they never get infected themselves. They don't develop fever, they don't develop any respiratory problems, nothing. They live happily. But the thing is, if you trouble them, you eat them up, and it's going to be a major problem. And that's when you have zoonotic diseases like one we are facing now, the Wuhan coronavirus disease which started by consumption of wild animals, including bats, civet cats, and pangolins. This happened in 2012, which caused SARS. SARS, uh, fortunately, died down. And uh, the 
critic structure of SARS is, as well as the COVID, this coronavirus, new coronavirus now, the new novel virus is about the same. So based on that, the genetic linkage is they calling it SARS-CoV-2. So they could come out with a vaccine which is going to be faster because it's a genetic makeup is the same as, as the SARS 2012. And uh, companies are rushing to make the vaccine. So we should be hopeful on from that front also besides the second wave as people are calling it. So India has responded quite dramatically and quite efficiently. They can always be objections to this that we could have done it earlier. Everything would have been done earlier, but we at least uh, with a travel ban and lockdown. And I was seeing figures today. We have about 31,000 in India, which is in which 20, nearly 8, 9,000 have recovered completely with two negative RT PCRs. So we've actually got only about 21, 22 cases, thousand cases left in the country. And there's a dipping of the, uh, the flat of the curve, as you call it, there's a dipping of the curve in the last five days. Uh, they, they take the number of cases every five days. So the five day period shows the last 10 days, there's been a dipping of cases. Now the government has also set in a Setu app, the Bluetooth app, it's useful for us, of the retina specialists also, because it's a, it's a tracker which you can just download from the government, uh, MyGov si uh, site, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and you can actually uh, fill, fill in your, all your data about your health and everything. Other person, the who everybody needs to do it because you will actually know that whether there is a patient who is COVID positive and is in your area. So you'll know exactly who you are, what kind of people are around you, if you're sitting in an aircraft or wherever. It may also act as a uh, as a you can show it on the phone at the airport if you see the green, then they'll know that you are absolutely away from the infection. So that may help you to get through. Uh, the initial, which is because they say you have a respiratory infection, not like wearing a mask, won't be allowed to enter the airport. So all this would be important to have this uh, happen. Now, returning to retinal surgery, this is going to be evolving. What is emergency and elective or uh, non-elective today is probably going to change in three months. So we have now entered the, probably the COVID at the junction of the COVID, non-COVID era still getting out of the COVID era. So we're not saying that we have come out of it. We're just saying we're reaching towards the end the way it looks like. We, the government and uh, most states have also have said that they continue for two weeks, but we have said that it should be a partial lock, lock uh, lift, lift, of the lift, lift of the lockout. So emergency urgent and not urgent is elective. So that's what I, I, um, the uh, IGO says elective. So we, uh, it's non-urgent by the ASCRS. So why should we differentiate cases? It's important because we are going to be getting very close in seeing these cases in the outpatient. Some of them may present only 1% reports are there from the published articles that connective infection is with follicular penetitis only seen in 1% cases of COVID positive patients. They may develop during the course of COVID disease when they are admitted in the ICU or they're in the isolation ward. They may develop in the midway some connective congestion. It's not that you've got to keep them with chloroquine drops or anything. It's just an ordinary symptomatic treatment for any viral conjunctivitis. The SARS in the tears, so there were a lot of controversies whether it was there or not. But recently, a very nice article has come out. It's actually in Press in Ophthalmology 2020. This long-term study shows that the risk of SARS-2 transmission through tears is extremely low, which is a good sign. So the tears you would be less worried about. And... Uh, the, also, but there's another thing that in China, Italy, who faced the grant initially, they found a lot of ophthalmologists, anti specialists. For that matter, even the surgeons and the anesthetists would be affected. And also, also the, the 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 intensive care unit doctors, because they had the, those they are the ones who are directly exposed to these patients. So, what are the emergency cases? Acute retinal detachments, where the macula is still attached. Now here I'm adding due to lack of space, ROP procedures like lasers, anti vegetation surgery because they cannot wait to stage four, stage five, or stage three for that matter. So acute retinal detachment with macula is attached. But also if you could have quadratic detachment, the macula is still on, it's the detachment is far away, it's a emergency. You also have a case with a acute retinal detachment, the macula is threatened. Or a case of a GRT. GRT I added myself, it's not in the IGO list. And uh, I just added it. And so these cases also come under the emergency category. 
that the EUA, this is again not been added, and I feel return uh, attachments which are and then operated blastoma diagnosis, trauma. Uh, you can get identify what all is there. You could see a foreign body. There's end of cell mitis or there even Coats disease and all. Those patients do require certain laser treatment. Coats would require a laser treatment. The RB would require a bracket therapy. Or would need to be in a, treated as an emergency. I feel the first trauma with the foreign body would need to get the foreign body located and operated. Another important in indication, which is there's acute end of time, is severe visual loss. So we have to do a bit for this, but they also mentioned evisceration as an option, which should be an emergency procedure. The patient is painful, he's having exuding plus corneal abscess, he should get evisterated. So they have included it in the American Academy of Ophthalmology recent update, which we bring out every week, and uh, but it's not there in our AIOS. So fresh submacular hemorrhage under the fovea, whether it's ECV induced or it's a mechanism induced, but for a fresh sub, sub, sub macular hemorrhage in the below the neural sensory retina, you must operate because it shears of the photoreceptor very severe damage. Earlier we take it out, the better it is. Now, TRD in the macula again is in the, especially in the monocular patient, but I think even in bimonocular patients, this can be discussed. But I think these should be operated, and right now in emergency, we are operating at our center. Uh, patient, uh, uh, Mac we are thinking PRDs, patients are going down vision. Often their poor, fellow eye is also having poor vision because they are seen symmetrically. Open group injuries without without front body is no question. This is operated as an emergency at RP center. We do it day in, day out. Even the night because of 24-7 casualty running, we do it. Exposed those buckles or anything, it's a rare thing nowadays, but if they are, we have to pick them up. And then retained lens, Written lens fragments, the elevated IOP, you have to take them up. Melling, sorry. Elevated IOP, you to take them out, elevated lens fragments. Or if you got malignant glaucoma, you need to take it out. If you've if you got malignant glaucoma, it's usually because of aqueous misdirection, mis 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 you got to do anti -retic. So, diagnostic. Between infectious causes and other causes. Yeah. It's with hemorrhage in the monocular bed. This is also mentioned. SCR is mentioned. The air is also mentioned. The dense vitreous hemorrhage, BRBO induced, a vein block induced, whether it's a tear induced or the PVD induced, the dense vitreous hemorrhage is coming under emergency procedures. I think the ASRS guidelines is given. So, Enucleation due to any cause, whether it's a tumor, ocular bracket therapy, as I just mentioned, if there's a patient having a retinoblastoma or a melanoma, diagnostic would be for infectious and onco oncological etiologies. All this comes under emergency procedures. Now, this is a little macula on threatened detachment, which you need to take up immediately as an emergency. Giant tears, again, you have to take it for the emergency. And from emergency cases, we come to urgent cases. Here, the risk of permanent severe visual loss without immediate surgery, not as high and treatment can be delayed for a little while, maybe a couple of weeks. It has not been specified how long, but it can be for a couple of weeks. And there you can see the detachment is already there. It could be a little older, but RD with TVR is also there. So they say membrane peeling is important. All procedures requiring membrane peeling, whether it's ERM or a PVR membrane, American Society of Red Specialists says a membrane peeling conditions have to be taken as urgent, or even sometimes they say it could be an emergency procedure. So all these membrane, because it is active PVR, then the patient's going to lose his eye by the time you wait. And his PVR will progress so much that you go into D3 or a D2, it's a narrow funnel RD, something which is not so appetizing for a surgeon, but rather if you've got a C1, C2, when you can actually operate and get away with very good results. Something like we will consider as an urgent surgery, not waiting more than a week or so, 10 days. And in those periods, we will also give topical anti steroids, etc. That's what I do like to do. Written uh, fragment with medically controlled IOP, yes, uh, as an urgent, can wait for a few days. The hemorrhage in which tear or detachment is suspected, again, uh, it's uh, open to discussion, but I feel that if you've got a tear or detachment suspected, it's better to operate as quickly as possible. Because you, the detachment may spread. With a tear, it may spread to a detachment, and the detachment may involve the macula. And once the macula is off, the vision recovery is never the same. 
so myopic traction macrometry is foveal detachment okay it can wait for two weeks maybe even four weeks dfc removal sub foveal is something which causes compression damage to the fovea and irreversible loss of vision so it should be taken without within a week or two not later than that and severe vmt and acute fvmh is also been given by the american society of retina specialists as you have acute vmt or acute hole formation to be taken as urgent because the visual recoveries are very good that's what they say now the elective surgery is the third part or the last part is elective surgery is non urgent they call it non urgent they have called it uh, elective so surgery can be delayed without significant risk to further vision loss of chronic macular hole a uh, dissipated in total lens if it's not causing any reaction and there's no lens matter you can let it stay for some time uh, it's not causing any retinal break then it's also erm which is not acute in onset of vm not acute in onset vitreous hemorrhage but no macular pattern trd in silicon oil which can wait for some time the pressures are under control now this has also been given as this thing now i'm not included anti vegers because iaos has totally excluded anti vegers and I, i think raja or somebody is talking about anti vegers so not included but i can tell you that iaos has not put in i have went to the whole article their preferred practitioners they have not put anything to do with anti vegers and we know that uh, you know amt patients require urgent injections dme and vein occlusions can wait for some time but us care md and pcvis do require so covid testing prior to vr surgery and pp for vr surgery very important suspected this is all pre op cases i feel we should get rt pcr presently for 3 months with an x ray test i was reading on some whatsapp group they are also saying get the rapid antibody serum test that is a very low sensitive low specificity it has errors it may give you false positives and false negatives so i don't know whether the house uh, are agrees to that but i feel uh, this is also a controversial thing that this is which going to do because as you yourself were saying it's a longer duration surgery so greater possibility of exposure is usually the respiratory exposure no if you get an ocular exposure the surgeon gets to a respiratory droplet the patient sneezes or something coughs violently you, you have to irrigate your eyes with bss and then wash eyes with capsaicin covered in covered in iodine or uh, It's important to understand that this is a respiratory disease. It does not pass through blood, so that's very important. Even blood can be donated, and uh, as long as the PCR is done, but usually they never find it. It's only the plasma, not the tissue, not plasma, because the antibodies. But there is no hematogenous spread. So a lot of uh, things which we we should be knowing that we have to. It's a respiratory basically disease, and we have to make sure. we don't get the respiratory infection from other patient from person so every patient may be a symptomatic can be a pcr could be a covid positive could be a asymptomatic covid positive as it's true so we have to take our guy precautions all the same so i at our center we are getting pcr test right now for all our suspected cases which generally we suspected cases means if we have some fever you are tst we send them to the infectious diseases sr the resident in fixed diseases but p of cases we are all getting the rt pcr as of now extra chest also and uh, all of them till now we have done about 15 20 cases all of them have been covid negative but if it's positive then you probably send them for the initial check then to the infectious diseases people and to the medicine department and then wait for two weeks before they can give us clearance to four weeks and then do the surgery for pp there is not much of change actually we don't need to spend too much money on that splash proof gowns are available by this uh, you know many companies they just gowns which have a non woven gowns so the front is non woven so the flash water doesn't kind of soak the gown in through and through so that's okay but uh, i don't know how much is that fluid going to help you because because the fluid will may not contain the virus the virus is there in the eyes but it can come out in the fluid yes this mask for self infection this is very important So you got to wear. Uh, ideally, you should wear a N95 or a three ply, uh, and a patient should wear a three ply because see, N95 respirator basically in prevents outside infection from coming in, and the three ply prevents uh, infected patient from transmitting his inside infection from out to out. So N95 is a great mask 
of course we have short supply in the country with great mass for us doctors for our for the medical care person not not only we are uh, taking care in the covid area but non covid area also you are the health care providers we have to have 95 on ourselves whether in the opd or whether in the theater or the uh, you wear the uh, apply with keeping all all around but of course you give the given the patient the mask you will say why do we need an internet you have so probably you can go uh, it into both ways you got patient or mask you got apply you got patient or apply you got enough gowns over the uh, over the patient eye goggles i feel can be there but you have to basically put it in your face your face your uh, eyes your nose your uh, your mouth your face and uh, nose and your you been covered the mouth and the nose has been covered so the eye goggles the transparent eye goggles would be better because the face shield actually fogs we've had residents who worked in the nicu uh, in the covid icu and all they said they were working at 3 by 60 vision because the shields uh, notoriously fog up so they say shields are after user sir they say we have we rather have eye goggles so we can get these transparent goggles very reasonable probably this can be used and an extra tip I don't think so. This, uh, Professor Atul, uh, could you kindly conclude? Yeah, I'm just concluding. This is just uh, showing you a 3D uh, surgery here. We're sitting about a about three three foot of a meter away. So the patient's face is here, and we're quite far away. So this really helps. She got protective glasses also. And this is the approach one uh, non-COVID patient. You can use a face shield in the OPD, but in the surgery, you can avoid the face shield and wear just N95 mask. This is only if you're doing a very heroic, with positive patient surgery. And of course, my last slide is uh, there's no end to putting on, uh, you know, various screens and uh, you know, various buttons over your face, gloves, napkin gloves. But it's not going to make much of a difference that way. You should know what is essential. and what is not essential so we don't have to uh, why over why over buy with each other we have to really do something extraordinary but i think if you take the necessary precautions things should be fine and i don't think the second wave is going to worry we go to worry very much about it thank you so thank you, you uh, professor atul that was a very elaborate uh, presentation very detailed presentation and i think this is something which has generated a lot of uh, interest this issue about elective versus emergency surgeries and uh, so it's all the million dollar question that's been floating around is different zones red versus orange versus green yes uh, different questions have come in and uh, it's about what was your recommendation and what happens in aims and what is the current uh, recommendation that you'd make for uh, doing uh, covid testing uh, to clarify it just for everybody uh for elective visa versus emergencies could you just put it out because audio was not very clear when you were talking about it okay so i personally feel that uh, any patient where if he simply he's having some symptoms or travel history abroad or he's got some respiratory infection he should get fully tested and uh, we can always wait for a day or two for the rt pcr it usually comes in for 24 hours and if he's for negative we can pick him up with full uh, full pp what the full pp means doesn't wear the has the evac suit but he wears proper wash splash proof gown and he's going to wear a mask probably an n95 with a symptomatic patient make the patient wear a mask have drapes and uh, its main thing is the sneezing and the coughing which is dangerous nothing else in these patients would you advise uh, covid testing in a absolutely asymptomatic patient who comes in for a emergency surgery maclon rd so with actually a covid positive patient can be totally asymptomatic yeah may, know, you, but, you, but in the PCR, current scenario no history of travel no history of contact coming from a green zone or a orange zone or a yellow zone as they call it rather yes. than hot spot yeah i i know this is a tough question because idly speaking may not be required but we medical personnel have to take care of ourselves we got to take care of our health we got to make sure the hospital you work in doesn't get infected you don't have so many cases you don't have so many personnel who get quarantined because the government and the everybody is already very strict about that so i would personally feel at this point the rules are relaxed we should get a covid test done prior to 
getting a surgery done not for op cases but for yeah, only for only surgery only for surgery we should get a code test so your recommendation is this yes. mandatory as far as possible as of now yeah. the guidelines will be evolving i suppose and with time maybe two months three months down the line no but in between i think there was something in the papers which said that you should not be getting uh, uh you should not be getting it done uh, routinely for every patient does not require a pre operative uh, covid test in fact uh, giri and i were discussing the other day and we said what if uh, somebody the patient turns around and asks you uh, have you had your covid test done and then how frequently will we get our own covid test done so i think it's it's a it may be a recommendation but i don't think we should take it as a kind of a mandatory or a, a sort of something which is absolutely essential if you have a reasonable assurance that that person has been asymptomatic and and is not been exposed to a situation where he would be so i think we have this will be discussed again in the pre op evaluation so, so i think uh, i think this question can be taken up a little later and we can debate on that yeah the thing is i mean if i may say so i think this is the only probably gray area other than that i don't think there is anything much to discuss at all <laughs> this is i mean this is the most contentious uh, issue i think we really, i think we should discuss this a little later on in this yeah I, I, yeah but i think this is the most important now uh, question that's being asked the issue that we need to discuss and probably you know we need to come to some sort of a we can take a poll <laughs> and uh, i mean take a poll or something like that say if five out of eight say yes i think it's necessary so because uh, as atul said unfortunately it's a very evolving phase what we think yesterday may be different today so anyway let the i mean talks go on let's we will uh, discuss it later i think yeah, we'll yeah, we can the panel discussion at the end at the end when we can i think uh, just one last comment there is a beautiful question here that has been designed by multiple agencies so we can ask the patients to fill in the questionnaire and if there is a suspicion we can selectively get the test done okay all right sure sure dr vishal oh so, yes, actually i was i mean if i may say so i was talking to one of my friends who is a very i mean very renowned biochemist now he told me that in a, in case you're not doing it and if you feel there's no suspicion at all you do a c reactive protein he says even in very mild infections it may not be covid but then at least it tells you whether the patient has any inherent infection so i don't know how much that is correct but he said the c reactive protein will be definitely raised it's a very simple test it doesn't cost anything more than 300 bucks and uh, it can be combined with your routine blood test get the c protein is a non specific inflammatory inflammatory no, test i agree with you atul but then once the say, I, I, no no it doesn't tell us whether there is covid yeah, there's no specific it tells, you know, it tells you whether it can also it can also have an infection in which case you don't do the surgery that's all or if you could pay extra test along with the you know except to so show some changes yeah, so uh, maybe sir we can take up this question later on and we can come back through this discussion i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, yeah. uh, we'll just move on to the next speaker dr mahesh nanmugam who's head of the vitro retina and ocular oncology services uh, shanghai hospital bangalore and he would be speaking to us on a very important thing how to reinvent our retina op leaf flow so that's something we all really want to learn in this era and how we can modify working in our opd so over to you sir thank you manisha just let me know if you can see my slides and can you hear me yep yes sir yes, we can sir. see yes. uh, good evening everyone uh, thank the vrsi particularly dr manisha and dr anand for this opportunity to meet you all virtually this evening so let's look at uh, how the workflow in the retina opd changes in this covid era so many of these things are common to gen to the uh, anti segment surgeons as well as post segment surgeons so many of these i have picked up from the igo as well so what are we doing at our hospital now at entry there is somebody who checks the temperature of the patient gives sanitizer to the patient as well as the attendant 
and ensures that they are, both of them are wearing a mask. So if they're not wearing a proper mask, we give them a mask as well. And then we ask for the history. This is a column which I picked up from the IJO. We ask for history of symptoms and history of exposure. And towards this, the patient has to give a declaration, absolving the hospital of any responsibility subsequently, but then I know how good uh, the, it will stand in the court of law. But they are expected to give a declaration about this, signed by the attendant as well as the patient. This column and this declaration you can find in the IJO, the recent IJO article. So let's look at a symptomatic patient. If there is a history of fever, shortness of breath, cough, and recently uh, in one of the uh, international webinars, they mentioned diarrhea as well, or if there is a history of direct and direct uh, exposure to contacts or high-risk contacts, the definition of these, once again, you can find in the IGO article. And if the patient does not have any after emergency, then we would defer an eye examination and refer to the COVID center. All this happens at the gate of the hospital itself. If the patient has these symptoms or exposure, and if there is an ocular emergency, then the patient is taken to a designated isolated area, which is away from the main hospital complex. And there is a team which is equipped with full PPE, and they do a quick examination, may not be a detailed examination, quick examination, and give them the treatment and then refer to a COVID center. And all the patients, the healthcare workers, and the attendants, and any person who comes to the hospital, is expected to fill in their information. So the hospital has their information along with a verified mobile number as well as the ID proof. All this is easily possible with the RIQ SETU app. This SETU app also tells us if, there's a, if the patient is potentially a COVID positive patient when you are approaching them. So I would suggest, and some of the hospitals actually insist that the patient has this downloaded and they check if the patient is listed in the app or not. And so this is a good app to have, and all the hospitals should probably use it to screen their patients at the entry. And to track these patients, it's particularly useful. Now, once the patient is not symptomatic, or rather the asymptomatic patient, enters the hospital, we follow this distancing everywhere. So this is the picture of the, the reception. The press marks are where the patient stands from another, another person. And you can see there is desks here, which is uh, separating the reception staff from the patient as well as the attendant. And this is the waiting area. You can see that in a three-seater, we have we expect only one patient to sit. If at all the patient's attender can sit here. So we have numbered them so that the patient is expected to occupy this seat from the beginning of the examination to the end of the examination. And we limit the entry to the hospital with, to only one attender. And we see limited patients in an hour and it's preferably by appointments so that the overcrowding within the hospital complex is avoided. Next step, if it is a post-operative patient where the vision check is not required, we fast forward the whole thing, see the patient by the consultant and send the patient off if it's a post-operative uh, consult. But if there's a need for a vision check, then this is an optometrist. These are the, the personal protective equipment, the optometrists, and pretty much all of them were in the hospital. There is a face shield, there's a mask, a three-play mask, and in our hospital, we have been uh, offering gloves to almost all of them. And as you can see, the patient also wear, wears a mask. Refraction only in select situations is done, and the NCT is something which is to be avoided. Now, moving on to retina specific, uh, what do we do in the OPD? Dilatation, if uh, it is possible, and if we know about the patient and the patient is unlikely to have a shallow anterior chamber, it's a follow up patient, we can ask the patient to dilate themselves at home and come over. Otherwise, if you were to dilate in the hospital, as you can see, the sister is not touching the patient. The, cyst, the, the patient herself retracts the lower lid, allowing us to apply the drop. And in case a patient is unable to retract the lower lid, you use a cotton bud like this to retract the lower lid and put the eye drop. So this is the current PPE which we are using. I use a cap, a, a protective goggle or a shield, a three-ply mask, and a scrub. So once we come into the hospital from home, we change into the scrub. And just before leaving the hospital, we change back to our street clothes and gloves as well. And pretty much the same thing the sisters also wear, except for the fact they wear a uniform rather than the scrub suit. So cleaning is something which has to be done through the day, through the hospital. And as soon as uh, a single patient is examined, the slit lamp, uh, the, where the chin rest, the uh, forehead uh, restraint, or, and as well as the chair is cleaned with alcohol. The floor, door handles, Contact surfaces are cleaned by the housing, uh, house cleaning uh, team every two hourly. And particularly, the restroom has to be cleaned and this has to be looked into as well because 
that's one of the potential areas for spread. So, the, like uh, opening the door is something which can be a tricky issue in uh, many of our places. So, we have devised something like this. So, in uh, particularly the uh, restroom doors which are spring loaded, and when we have to pull, you have to use, you have to touch the knob which can be touched by many people. So, we have devised one strap in which you can put your foot in and remove it. And this is like a very simple solution is to have these pieces of uh, newspaper cut and hung next to the door. You tear one newspaper, use it to hold the uh, door knob, open it, and then throw the newspaper inside. So this way, you cannot be having uh, the solution, the alcohol solution within the uh, toilet. Instead of that, you can use this to not to touch the knob. So this is a very simple solution which can be done. Coming on to examination room, we prefer not to use air conditioning. Of course, being in Bangalore helps. And we have open doors policy. The windows are also kept open. And coming on to examination techniques and the equipment which you use, all of us are familiar with this uh, slit arm shields and how to make them. So there's an acrylic shield which is uh, cleaned the, at the beginning of the day as well as at the end of the day. You can wash them, take it off and wash them, or you can use alcohol swabs as well. And much, this is a much more elaborate uh, slit lamp shield. Of course, on the other side, you do have a bed shield as well. So this is on the patient side, and uh, some, some of us do have this elaborate shield in addition to this bed shield which you can see. Uh, moving on to how do we do a uh, 90-day examination, we have modified the lens like this. We have wrapped the lens with uh, the cling wrap. So you, as you can see, despite the cling wrap, you can see it quite well. So prefer not to touch the patient. He's touching the slit lamp forehead uh, thing. Yeah, this is without the cling wrap and this is with the cling wrap. You see one extra reflex, but it's good enough to see. As soon as it is over, it's sprayed with uh, the 99.9% isopropyl alcohol and left there. Of course, the other alternative to is to wash the lens, but it's particularly difficult and likely to scratch the lens after each examination. So you can uh, clean wrap the 70 day of the lens, which helps in uh, like examination as well as keeping it clean. And as you can see, when the sister is spraying, she's spraying on her gloved fingers as well, so that gets uh, that gets sterilized as well. Coming on to the indirect ophthalmoscopy and the laser indirect ophthalmoscope. So this is the shield which is uh, we have loaded onto the uh, indirect ophthalmoscope. And many videos and many uh, images are available on the net as to how to make them. This is essentially the uh, sheet with which we put the FFA photographs. So that is the sheet you can design them to make it as a face shield. There is a cutout here. So this is not obscuring your vision and doesn't get to fog. And through this cutout is where the direct ophthalmoscope sits here. Coming on to how do we do the indirect ophthalmoscope in our place? So use uh, alcohol scrubs. And here he is already wearing the face shield. And this again is a modified lens. Either we wash the lens after each case, but here we have loaded it onto a PVC pipe. And on the other side, there's an acrylic sheet the same sheet which comes in the face shield. We have made it like this. You can see it's a decent view. So though there is one additional reflex, but when we are doing this indirect ophthalmoscopy, as we can see, our fingers are touching the patient. So you, before we take off the indirect, we use alcohol so that we don't touch the indirect with contaminated hands and also spray, spray the alcohol on the lens as well as wherever we have touched. And we can actually spray it onto the lens very easily because the lens surface is covered by this uh, plastic sheet so the lens doesn't get uh, affected and it can be used through the day. So there's a modification we have made of the plus 20 diopter lens. How do we examine an ROP in this era of COVID? So the child is uh, swaddled in a plastic sheet in addition to the regular cloth uh, swaddling which we use. And uh, as we cannot put a mask on the patient, as until now all the adult patients have been wearing a mask when we have examined, but the child we cannot put a mask and it keeps uh, screaming and crying, so possibly liberating a lot of aerosol. So it's better that the examining team wears a preferably an N95 kind of a mask, not a simple three-ply mask. For other examination, we use a three-ply mask. IDO with shield is what is to be preferred. A disposable glove is again worn when we examine a child with ROP. And uh, when the IGO they have mentioned a sterile gown, that's something which is up to us. But all this is, is all this is if there is no history of COVID. If the child is known to have COVID or the parents have been known to have COVID or exposed to 
contacts who have COVID, then better that this child is examined with full PPE in a COVID center. So now moving on to the investigations which we commonly perform in the clinic. So this is a patient sitting in the OCT with the, with the mask in place. Most of the time, what happens, there is a gap here, and the patient, patient sits in the front of the OCT and breathes. There's a possibility of the breath getting, dis, getting deposited onto the lens. That's the reason I was, and the next patient comes very close to this particular deposit. That's the reason I was wondering whether we can cover it up. So we have uh, done this. We wrapped the OCT with the cling wrap. It's very simple to do. So this once again is to prevent us from cleaning the OCT lens repeatedly. We can use this cling wrap. And the OCT procedure is pretty much done in the same way. Actually, we find that like even Okta can be done with this uh, cling wrap in place. You can see the images are pretty good. Only downside is there will be this reflex. So the color photograph will not come properly, though the OCT images come beautifully. Now, how do we do an ultrasound? So we spray with alcohol, clean the probe, then put the gel and go ahead with the ultrasound. The only change is like the, the surgeon is wearing a glove. Otherwise, you better that like we put a cap on the patient, a new cap on the patient, because sometimes you may have to hold the head of the patient to do the ultrasound. So better to do put this cap on so that like the I had the, the surgeon's hands are not contaminated. FFA and ICG, I would. Uh, avoid in the present situation and would suggest doing this only in absolutely unavoidable cases because it's a long dur duration investigation may take about 10 to 15 minutes in a closed room. There's a risk of blood spell though Dr. Atul mentioned that it's unlikely to be hematogenously spread and but potential for aerosol is quite high because the patient can rich during an FFA and ICG. So how do we do a laser and PRP if we have a single spot laser machine I would suggest we do it with the uh, with the LIO. So this is how you clean the lens only the the surface which goes onto the cornea. And uh, that is good enough, but if you want to clean the, uh, you want to cover the laser as well, you can cover it with the, with the, with the uh, cling wrap. As you can see, these are the burns without the cling wrap, and this is with the cling wrap. You can see the burns are a little bit smaller, but it is possible to get good burns despite the cling wrap being on in place. So if it is a multi-spot laser, then it's better to do PRP with the multi-spot laser. So you just clean the laser at the end of it like that. If you have a single spot laser on a slit lamp, it's better to do an LIO when we want to do when we don't want to do a PRP. So how do, how have we um, deployed our manpower? We have divided the whole team into two teams, and uh, one team works in the morning, one team works in the afternoon, and the team should not meet physically. For for instance, if you come across one patient who has COVID, then the whole team is likely to be quarantined. And the hospital work should not go, go it should not be interrupted. So we have divided, divided ourselves into two teams and we function in shifts. And people cohabiting, cohabiting, for instance, a husband and a wife belong to the same team, or people who are in the same uh, apartment complex or from the uh, from a from a an individual house, they form in the same team. So to summarize, the whole aim of this presentation is to get avoiding, is to avoid getting infected or transmit the infection when delivering care. The bottom line is we have to protect our eye, nose, mouth from aerosol and fomite. I thank Dr. Debashish and Mr. Balu, our electrician, who were able to put every idea of mine into practice and the biomedical team of Shankarai Hospital and the VR team. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Dr. Mahesh, for that extensive uh, presentation. And it was having a lot of useful tips how we can modify our retina OPD flow. There is one question, sir, that how do we do an examination on the slit lamp when you have your goggles uh, on, you know, does that cause a problem? Like with the slit lamp on? Yeah, you can, you yeah, can how do but you with the bread, having the bread shield, you don't actually need the goggles also. But the goggles I had showed was a clear plastic goggle which went over my glasses. So with that, you are able to see reasonably well. It's not too much of a difficulty. And there's another question that the uh, the cling film that you have placed on the OCT, do you really need to replace it after every patient or you just clean it up? You can replace it at the end of each day. You can do that. But in between cases, what we can do is to spray the alcohol onto a tissue and wipe it. That's good enough as well. 
Dr. Shobit, you have any comment? Anisha? I think uh, Dr. Mahesh Chandra's hey, presentation was a real bouquet of innovations, uh, a compliment to the COVID era, and it's very well received. I really enjoyed the PVC pipe wrapping of the indirect lens. My only question was, which you've already, he's already answered, that the cling wrap does not need to be replaced after the examination, it just needs to be sprayed. I have, you know, a, I have a small comment to make. There are these wrap around clear glasses which they use after LASIK surgery and cataract at about 70 rupees. And you know, it's just very easy actually wearing those glasses. I, I mean, can I just, I mean, uh, Mahesh? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, nice presentation, sir. I have only one doubt, which I think you need to clarify. Uh, you work, you see, when you go enter the office, I don't know whether this half day working in two groups is, it, I mean, it, whether they will agree to that. Because from what I understand is one team per day, okay. But then one team morning, one team afternoon, and you have a COVID that particular day. I don't know whether they will agree that, you know, we were there in the morning, the other one was there in the afternoon. I do not know whether that will stand uh, the, this thing in the, I mean, uh, whether that, I mean, that, that holds good. That, I mean, I just want the, your opinion on that. No, I agree to that, like, because this is something which our hospital has come up with having six hours, like morning eight to two and two eight. But of course, I agree that like it can be one day, one day. I agree perfectly. But what we are still in the process of actually ironing out this creases. So what we do is just before the first team goes out, we ensure all the patients go out. And none of the patients who come who are posted yeah, for the I second half. I, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. But uh, what we have done is one team works Monday to Wednesday. The other team works Thursday to Saturday. Yes. So that's, that's what, what we are doing in US too. Five days on, five days off. And the logic is because like Dr. Geridhar, it may stay in the air. Like we have a very poor understanding, but if some, um, Dr. Mahesh has a good ventilation, but our hospital, for example, we don't have windows. So if one patient walks in and for the next eight hours, it's on the surfaces, it's in the air, so that might be another strategy, you know, five days on, five days off. That helps. One question. Why not the OP? Do you fumigate the OP on a regular basis? We don't use fumigation, sir. We only wipe the surfaces. Oh, no, that is, yeah. Do you wipe the surfaces, I mean, generally? And, uh, so one question, the directed directed to the, because both Dr. Cyrus and Dr. Mahesh and Dr. Gindar also. What do you think should be the capacity? Supposing a patient is seeing an empirical figure in OPD is seeing about 150 patients a day. What should be the OPD once we start full working? 50%. 40 50%. patients, 50, 50 patients. 50%. Or what capacity should one work to? 50%, half. WHO is given two for 20. We yeah. are you seeing 20, it should be two. So I would say, so one ten, I would one say 30, to 30 to 35 percent. I think uh, the important thing here, I don't think this figure is the way to calculate. The basic way to calculate is you see the capacity of your OPD and you see the capacity of the people who are doing your workup. The capacity of the OPD cannot be exceeded. If the space there is for 15 people, then you can only keep 15 people in there. And if your turnaround time is one hour, then it means 15 patients per hour. That is how you decide how many patients you can see per hour. Now, if you want to see more patients, you can't increase the number of patients in the hour. You increase the number of working hours. Working hours. So why should you? I, I mean, if you have the work, you spread it over a longer period. You increase the time you spend per, per patient but you can still do the same number of patients or maybe close to that by increasing the number of your hours. 
the yes. basic question being uh, there's a lot of debate uh -huh. on that you can still handle the appointment patients but how do we handle the walking patients yes. in a retina so, so an answer is very simple for that they very strictly walk ins can only be taken up on a time which is slotted for them and they have to move out at that time and come back at the time allotted to them so they they will be seen that day but they may be seen 2 hours later they have to go outside the center see we have to have some strictness in this aspect but the second more important aspect is even i mean um, so that's what the, my suggestion would be you do alternate day that way nobody's opd gets affected you see if you're seeing your patients alternate day your patient uh, you know the especially in a big hospital it may not matter where there is a whole group of people but if you're if you're doing it in a small group of people an alternate day system ensures that you lose you don't lose touch with your patients now you increase the number of hours but do alternate day you've got a three day week which is with minimal decrease in the number of hours at so, the end of the day at the end of each day if you are going to fumigate all this issues about the air having something goes away that's all we need so dinesh now we'll come back to you i just have a few uh, quick questions for dr mps one is sir that how do you handle the cash flow in the opd and the second is that is there any role of doing a whole body sanitization of the patients when they are entering the hospital this uh, whole body sanitization is not supposed to be uh, scientific and it's been given up so all those tunnels are being dismantled so that's not a great idea and the cash flow at the present moment we have not gone full flow we have started working on this for the last 2 3 days so right now the, the girls are taking the cash but as i mentioned they are wearing gloves as well and we prefer we suggest that like they use uh, digital modes of payment but we have to see how things work out okay so uh, thank you dr mahesh for a excellent presentation we'll move on to our next speaker uh, dr raja narayanan from uh, lv prasad uh, hyderabad also the secretary of uh, peter retina society of india i request raja to speak on uh, modifications and protocols for intravitreal injections and lasers raja uh, yeah can you see my slides yes we can could you full screen yes fine so uh, after a couple of nice presentations i'll be talking on uh, intravitreal injection that's probably one uh, again uh, some debatable areas are there we'll be bringing out which are the areas where there are debates and we can have a discussion on that so there is no one solution for everyone i know there are many many hundreds of practitioners who have logged in uh, some who are not in any covid area they may not have even had one patient of covid uh, in their entire district but uh, they may be wondering why this debate is going on whereas some may be in areas who are afraid of coming out they are in lockdown areas so it depends on how busy your clinic is and uh, the main point as dr mahesh shanmugam has said is to prevent infection to yourself and to others so if your clinic is not busy you are waiting for patients probably guidelines in terms of to avoid such and such patient or this oct or that laser may not be very much uh, applicable to you so if you have very few patients and uh, maybe one patient per hour you don't have to defer an injection for a dme but if you are overloaded with patients you are unable to decongest the opd those are the areas where some guidelines may be applicable where we may have to look at the guidelines issued by uh, aios or what we are going to discuss where which cases you can avoid uh, urgent injections so basic rule is follow the state and district administration rules never let your guard down don't ever think that this my district or my area doesn't have covid or this patient is unlikely don't don't go into heroism and uh, use whatever equipment has been recommended and be punctual with your work hours it has been a kind of known thing that in hospital whenever you go the doctor comes usually half an hour one hour late than the first patient's appointment sometimes even later but that is probably not going to be acceptable why i mean when you want to uh, kind of uh, decongest your opd you are trying to going to avoid calling patients now the, the guidelines which we will be talking will tell which patients can be deferred 
but at the same time if you want your revenue to also be uh, better than what it is then we have to be punctual and not delay patients or con congest uh, the waiting area one important thing which improves the capacity now capacity is not just the uh, area uh, you know the floors the number of square feet or the number of rooms you have we had discussed how many patients per hour can be seen and that has to be reduced because of covid one thing which can offset that is the efficiency now so capacity is an uh, it's a function of efficiency too so if something you take one hour for any process if you can reduce that process by half that means your capacity is doubling so if you can see if you are earlier seeing let's say 10 patients per hour and you are taking 25 minutes or 30 minutes per patient for various processes if you can make the process more efficient by whatever means reducing refractions reducing intraocular pressure or not doing octs in all patients or not doing fundus photo and autofluorescence in all patients or even the other non clinical processes if you can make them more efficient that also increases your capacity so obviously either you increase your work hours and same follow the same old processes which you were following or if you don't want to increase the work hours or only minimally you have to make the process more efficient so avoid walk-ins i can understand that yes patient will come so everyone's answer will be how can i avoid walk-ins but initially you have to be strict you have to tell as dr talwar mentioned that okay sorry you were given this appointment you came late or you don't have an appointment and i'll have a slot later on please go out and come back and it's a question of time people will understand like you don't come late for a train or flight patients will start understanding that you cannot go late for your hospital appointment and also triage based on or whatever processes you can do before the patient comes in or have qr codes we have developed qr codes self checking kiosks non touch so that those processes waiting in line just for the receptionist to say that okay now you can go in and sit in your waiting hall so make those processes uh, efficient um and uh, also be reachable i mean teleconsult is making you more reachable who is going to be reachable in this era now is going to be a game changer for business you cannot avoid phone calls and say i won't talk to a patient now let us see what are the indications for examination and treatment the main thing is on the right side which is the high risk which you have to take on priority any active pdr wet macular degeneration which is active new onset crv also is usually an emergency and then there are forms of uveitis which have uh, you know acute vision loss retinal vasculitis and also if patients who have just recently been started on uh, uh, treatment of injections for wet macular degeneration you cannot stop that treatment in between but there are cases where you may be able to defer the treatment by a few weeks such as macular edema due to diabetic retinopathy or uh, post operative macular edema uh, or even uh, stable anterior view where this who are on regular medication so these are kind of medium risk where if you are in a zone where you can't take too many patients you can ask them to come back all back after a few weeks and then there are other low risk uh, patients whom we don't have to discuss at this time so we have evidence why diabetic macular edema as such is not an emergency that you have to inject today or tomorrow we have various trials starting from the old uh, publication from pgi also where you have, if you have a good systemic control you can have these patients you know improve on their own too but what about uh, patients uh, who are at this time uh, not in good control still you can defer treatment especially if you have a good baseline visual acuity like we have this protocol v result so those patients who had center involved in macular edema mind you these are not non center involved in macular edema but center involved in macular edema with uh, good vision at baseline that is 20 25 or 6 9 or better then they were there was an observation group versus laser versus ably perceptant these patients the two years had no different outcome so diabetic macular edema as such can be deferred by a few weeks there are no worries on that front but again as i said this is not a one brush solution for everyone if your clinic is not busy you nobody is stopping you from treating any of these patients so uh, if, but take adequate precautions in terms of protection against spread of the virus 
and then what about uh, macular degeneration there are uh, multiple treatment protocols there are some proactive treatment that is fixed dosing which is not used in any place in terms of monthly injections nobody is able to afford uh, both the cost as well as the visits of monthly injections then you have the treatment extend protocol which is also a proactive one where you inject these patients at uh, some extended intervals even if there is no fluid that's something which we have to look carefully in india very few of our practitioners follow treat and extend most of us follow treat to target or treat and observe in the sense you extend the uh, intervals between injections and if there is no fluid we don't inject but at this time if you keep on uh, extending the follow up and you have patients who are not coming in it may be better to follow a treat and extend regimen wherein you do treat the inject the patients even if there is no fluid and i'm not going into the details of how you follow the treatment treat and extend regimen so in this uh, uh, study of alta where they gave uh, three loading doses and uh, followed by uh, treat and extend intervals by either uh, two weeks or four weeks what it showed that even four week extension you don't have to extend by two two weeks you can even extend by four four weeks those patients had uh, similar results with those who had two week extension so if even if you want to follow treat and extend protocol you may want to extend by four weeks instead of following the patient every two weeks so and then there is also the question of uh, the compartment of fluid on ma in macular degeneration patients we all know that at this point of time some subretinal fluid can be tolerated in macular degeneration provided there is no intraretinal fluid so if there is intraretinal fluid you have to be aggressive with the treatment but up to 200 microns of subretinal fluid you may want to avoid injections again this is as a general even in the non covid era but uh, it's definitely worth now deferring patients who have minimal amount of fluid and this is the graph which shows that patients who had intraretinal fluid did worse than those who did not what about oct when to do oct now that's again a big challenge you want to do oct in every patient fundus photo auto fluorescence whatever we especially in in and uh, academic institutions we tend to do all of these investigations it's not just about the time it also uh, you have to share that equipment again every time you have to clean that equipment there is risk of contamination for my transmission so uh, when to do oct that's again a debate but at this point of time there is some talk which we can discuss during the loading phase you need an oct let's go straight for injections that also reduces the patient uh, service time within the clinic as well as avoids uh, other uh, modes of contamination you can also probably avoid macular line scans in every visit i just go for a cube and then it can be avoided again these are if your clinic is extremely busy and you have to cut down on the number of patients but again if your clinic is not very busy just make sure that you are not contaminating or increase in the risk of infection but you can treat any of these patients and use your home, uh, protocols what about home dilation if a patient comes dilated especially if the patient has been on regular follow up uh, and you know that these patients are stable don't have a history of glaucoma uh, home dilation is also one consideration which some we do for lasers we uh, home dilate and ask the patients to come but uh, that's a point that you may want to discuss uh, or consider whenever you have that increases the throughput time your patients are out uh, rapidly from your clinic avoid uh, routine fundus photographs and auto fluorescence and uh, uh, what about lasers uh, as dr mps say, he elaborated very nicely on lasers probably avoid the non contact uh, uh, you you prefer non contact with lio for non macular lasers do prps with uh, 20d macular lasers or dme brb has especially gone down significantly i rarely recommend uh, but that should be avoided in most cases very rarely we do especially in non dme rb cases like chronic csr if you want to do macular laser you could but uh, especially if it's acute csr consider deferring but yes wherever you have to do you may want to do that there are some cleaning protocols uh, voc lenses they have their uh, on the website very nice options various uh, uh, cleaning agents which are effective but uh, betadine is also effective against sars cov2 and mers this was published way back in 2018 so that's probably something uh, uh, we we do it for injections why not try it for laser just put a drop of betadine before and after the laser so that prevents contamination of the laser uh, lens as well what about sodium hypochlorite uh, 0.5% something which i uh, uniformly saw so that's one solution which you could use for disinfecting your contact lenses as an additional uh, precaution so in conclusion 
use your judgment there are enough guidelines and be responsible most dmo dma and rbo can be deferred but that's if your clinic is busy if your clinic is not busy you can schedule an appointment for those patients continue your regular treatment and treatment treat and extend is recommended as it reduces frequent visits that is one thing and probably there is no role of uh, covid testing for intravitreal injections and lasers at least at this point of time thank you so uh, thank you uh, raja for a very extensive and elaborate uh, presentations uh, on uh, intravitreal injections and uh, lasers uh, one specific question about uh, consent forms uh, do you have are you using a modified consent form for these specific procedures lasers and intravitreal injections yeah so as, as dr mp has also pointed out it's a it's a regular consent which we are taking now routine consent for all patients whether they undergo any procedure or not because there is a risk of transmission if the patient visits the hospital so we are taking a regular consent for a many patient that they, they will not hold us accountable for any um covid if they turn out to be positive later on uh, but it's debatable whether it's uh, it holds in a court of law or not but we are taking it as a routine for all patients okay. question. another question for yourself and perhaps dr mahesh also uh, this is something i have also noticed is that uh, we can tape our uh, masks and stuff but when you doing a ntd or a contact procedure laser uh, the, there's a lot of uh, fogging from the patient's breath patients who are using masks that tends to happen uh, do you do something to avoid that especially it becomes i think more critical when you doing uh, uh, laser you can actually tape the mask no micropore tape like what we use for our own when we do surgery yeah no, can, uh, the, the patients patient. uh, the patient's uh, breath is uh, fogging the lens the seminal yeah, so when you do that you have to put it for them patient for them Yeah, I often ask them to hold their breath. I often ask them to hold their breath for thirty seconds. <laughs> you know, that may be difficult. And then it is best to put it tape as Doctor Modi that says. Yes, I think. Then put the microphone. Yeah, microphone and make sure there is no, you know, press it hard so there is no air coming out. If any air comes out, it shields or the glass. Raja. Yeah, so a lot of our patients are actually wearing wearing those cloth masks which you cannot put a tape on. it's kind of difficult but i haven't faced that but i don't know if uh, you know if there is an option of putting a tape yes that's that should be mandatory and it's also important they wipe their part very nicely before putting a tape otherwise the tape does not stick uh, because they are coming yes, yeah. sweaty sure. uh, raja is there any change in the technique of injection that you do in, in this era like you know are you wearing a gown and doing it or you are doing with gloves after scrubbing or what's you know now when you give so, the injection yes yeah, so we would be wearing a, a gown and a regular gloves and probably uh, wear a, you have to wear an n95 so all the precautions which you otherwise take you take but uh, it's not a very long contact so i don't think there is regular, regular gown or a or a, a, that pp regular gown regular gown we don't regular. expect any yeah regular gown because we don't expect any fluid contact in this you are not going to get Uh, any of those but n95 is definitely advisable uh, even for intravitreal injection raja we were using gowns we were using gowns right from the beginning of uh, since giving intravitreal okay so for us it's no change we use it as a roti prep and normal life a surgery intravitreal yeah, we always wear gowns face mask uh, cap we always and do we it. don't it's important not to talk yeah yeah so so the dr murli that's question was whether to use the disposable non fluid kind of gown or the regular roti gown so the our regular roti gown. gowns are uh, cloth gown so yeah we we wear the regular roti gown so from from that perspective nothing changes except that instead of a surgical mask i would recommend n95 mask exactly. but uh, yes but other than that i don't see any change i think besides n95 nothing else changes i think i prefer to I have it five then other mask for the doctor the advantage of that is i'm sorry yeah no the advantage of having a n95 with another three ply mask on top is you can discard the, the three ply later on at the end and the n you increase the life of the n95 that way otherwise you'll be changing that also all the time see uh, um, yeah, yeah, respirator n95 respirator prevents outside infection from getting in 
while the pre-ply prevents the infection from with the, from the guy who's wearing it to outside. Yes, so exactly. Purposes are totally different, so there's yeah, no. Yeah, I know, but you of, can throw it out. Does it make sense to put the two? The advantage of the second one is only so that that prevents it from coming. You throw it at the end of the day. You don't need to keep it. Your Dr. Vishali, you wanted to make a point, ma'am? I just want to say it's very important to have a very right fit of N95. N95 comes in three sizes. So N95, if it is not rightly fit, that can be more hmm. harmful than a free ply mask. So it's very important. I have a question for everybody here now, because what uh, Raja said, it's a very important thing about in a less busy clinic, it doesn't matter if you pick up say routine practice also. Now it's very important if we are saying this, then our guidelines cannot say that these are urgent and these are not urgent. Because the moment you say that, tomorrow the person who had, say he had less cases, he gave an injection, tomorrow the patient got COVID. Now you have a medical legal case that why did you give me the injection when the guidelines say don't give it? So we have to have some kind of consensus on this and we can't end up saying that in in a heavy clinic, I'm not giving it. Now, I hope we are not making guidelines based on the fact that it's a heavy clinic. I mean, just because you have a higher workload, you cannot, you cannot say, let's not give the injection. I think the important thing to stress then is that your injections should not be getting crowded together rather than saying you can't give for this injection. So let's have that differentiation. I, I'd like everyone's opinion on that. Quite evolving consensus. Yes. Priority. It can just be called the priority list. Consensus on prioritization rather than making emergency. Yeah. yeah, I think. Go ahead, It's a kind of triad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Dr. Think. Hemant wants to say. Yeah, Hemant, one last comment and then Manisha. Yeah. N95 is also an exhalation, exhalation filter, provided you don't have the exhalation filter on your mask. It also prevents your air from going outside. That is why in the OT they suggest that you do not wear the mask with an exhalation filter. The logic to wearing a surgical mask over an N95 is if it has an exhalation filter, you want to do precisely what Dr. Atul said. You want to prevent your secretions harming the patient. If your N95 does not have an exhalation filter, then your N95 mask also protects the patient. That's point number one. Second, it, the, N, the surgical mask over the N95 prolongs the life of your N95. And the N95 can be used for multiple patients. It doesn't mean that every time you operate a patient, you will use a new N95. The FDA has given a waiver for this. Using it for four days. Four days, one mask. Correct. No, and multiple That's what patients. That's the CDC says. Multiple CDC patients says. on the same day, you don't need to change the N95 mask. Oh, no, no. The full day, day is over. Four days is in the brown bag. You Correct. So I want to the cases. Now, the second thing is we cannot legislate every work situation. And we should not attempt to do so. Because everybody's work situation is going to be different depending on where he's working. Uh, what may be acceptable for us may not be acceptable to the administration of a different hospital. And that depends purely on where the person is working. So I, I would think that may, merely leaving these as loose guidelines to be influenced by the local working conditions would be an important phase to put in. Yes, sir. The guideline mm -hmm. is meant for those who are extremely busy, which ones they can defer or avoid or how to take care of them. So that's what it is. It's about, uh, Dr. MP has also made the same point that it's about this entire discussion and guideline is not to read about, learn about DME or RBO. It's about how to mitigate risk trans transmission of uh, the virus. That's so, all. It's so the important point thing well is taken. I think uh, in the interest of time, we need to move on at the ask uh, Manisha to produce an ask. Yeah, okay. so uh, I think the points are all very well taken and it's uh, primarily to bring up all these issues so that, you know, some kind of guidelines can come up at the end. So moving on to the next talk by Dr. N.S. Murlidhar. He is the director of Retta Institute of Karnataka from Bangalore and also the vice president of VRSI. 
he would be telling us uh, on a very important issue that what all pre-op evaluation is required if a patient is being planned for a VR surgery. So over to you, sir. Thanks, everyone. And uh, it's been nice to see the discussions going on. The very fact that we have so many questions and discussions means that there is nothing consolidated about it. These are all guidelines and they can be variable based in place to place. I thank uh, Anand and Manisha for making me part of this wonderful webinar. I'm going to talk about preoperative evaluation of a patient who needs to undergo retinal surgery in the COVID era. And most of the guidelines, what we talked about is based on the preferred practice patterns published recently by Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Of course, the basic premise that they're all working on is highlighted here in this article where it says that all the patients should be assumed to be potentially carriers of the virus throughout the duration of their stay. So the basic premise with which we all work is that all the patients and their attendants should be considered potentially infective. So this is the premise with which we are all working. And the pre-op evaluation can be divided into four uh, different areas. One is a special consent. I think this has been talked about already by Mahesh and others also. This is taken for all patients when they enter the hospital. And this is needed to reduce the liability to the doctor and the hospital. As Mahesh pointed out, at this point of time, we have no idea how legally this is valid, but it is better to take this consent so that the patient also realizes that there is something, some risk involved in coming to the hospital and getting examined, even though the hospital and the doctors and the patient himself may take the best efforts. In, despite that, there is a risk of infection. It is better that the patient is made aware of it. And we are using the COVID-19 pandemic emergency ophthalmic treatment consent form that's given out by the All India Ophthalmic Society, which is available at kios.org. Now, this is also used as it is incorporated into the surgical consent for any surgery that you do, whether it's a retinal detachment or injection or whatever, please include this also along with that particular consent for that specific surgery. So this is important to make sure that you have a special consent also taken for all patients, you know, before uh, you do the surgery. Now, it's important that comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, patients with chronic kidney disease, they need to be optimally controlled and they should really be fit before you undertake any surgery. And therefore, it is desirable that you ask them to get a fitness from a physician in these times, especially COVID era. We know that these patients are at higher risk for mortality and morbidity if they contract COVID. And if patient has uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension or some other systemic problem, which does not make him fit, then you may have to really postpone him till he is really fit and you know you may not be able to take him up for surgery. COVID related workup is something that has always gathered a lot of attention and a lot of discussion. I am sure this is going to rake up a lot of discussion today. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is that often in our practice, the patient comes in and has a problem and needs surgery. And it takes few days and even sometimes a week before the surgery is scheduled for a variety of reasons. So it's important when the patient comes in for surgery, you repeat the questions regarding the COVID symptom in the interim period. Has he had any fever, sore throat, cough, etc.? Has he been exposed? Either himself or family members, have they had any contact with the infected person? So it's important to repeat this history of COVID symptoms and history of exposure because there could be a time gap between the examination and scheduling of surgery. There are three tests that are often, you know, done to find out whether the patient is suffering from COVID infection or not. Let's look at each three of them. The gold standard today for finding out whether the patient has a COVID or not is the RT-PCR testing. And this is being done in many laboratories in India. Most of the testing centers in India are all in the government setup. And ICMR has given very strict guidelines as to which patients need to undergo this PCR testing. Everybody cannot undergo this. Only these four, five categories of patients can be sent for testing for PCR. And recently, in the last month or so, government has allowed many private labs also to open up and do these testing. Despite this, the availability of PCR testing for general public and for our patients who need to undergo surgery is a big question mark today. Therefore, although it's a gold 
uh, gold standard test for RT PCR. RT PCR. We need. We cannot probably insist on this for every patient. Look at the contrast in United Kingdom. They insist on a PCR and antibody testing for all patients who are ha having planned surgical patients, uh, and then they go on to uh, you know define how to deal with them once they get both the tests. Today we are not in that safe position. So although we should insist that preoperatively all patients should get a COVID swab testing done, we may not be able to do this because of practical problems. In Bangalore, the test is done in mostly government centers. The private labs are charging 4,500 rupees. Today, if you ask a patient to undergo the test, the increased cost could be a major problem in getting the test done. And most of the times, the 24 hours is the time involved to get the report back and therefore it could be another stumbling block to get the PCR test done in our patients. I am told that in Delhi and maybe in other metros as well, doctors are insisting on COVID testing before surgery and they are getting it done. You know, I don't know, I would like to know the view of the other people in the other metros regarding this. But in Bangalore, I don't think we are able to get the PCR test done for all our patients preoperatively. And even the AIOS guideline does not recommend it as a routine. However, to confound matters and put confusion into the minds of all of us, there is a recent central government directive which says that all inpatients in every hospital should undergo a COVID testing. Even though they are not suffering from COVID, they are admitted for a variety of other reasons and they should all undergo COVID testing. However, this guideline has not been approved by ICIMR as of now and therefore we don't know as of now. So as of now, COVID testing, although it is a gold standard, may not be possible in all patients. What about the rapid antibody test? The problem with this is that it can only become positive after the patient is infected and even then it takes some 7 to 11 days. And therefore, it does not help us if the patient is in the first 7 to 14 days before he develops the antibodies. If this is negative, it doesn't really help us. Whereas if it is positive, maybe we can defer the surgery or tell the patient that you have COVID and we cannot operate on you. And recently, there have been a lot of doubts raised about the validity and the accuracy of these tests in the media. And ICMR was forced to withdraw all the test kits and suspend the rapid antibody testing. It started about a week ago. So as of now, I don't think this is recommended as a routine pre-op test in our patients. Let's look at another modality called chest X-ray. Now, chest X-ray is important because lung is one of the major organs affected in COVID and chest X-ray changes are seen in almost all the patients with COVID. And in situations where the patient comes to the hospital with COVID infection suspicion, that's a very good test to do because the PCR test can take 24 hours to 48 hours to come back. Meanwhile, the treating physician can use a chest X-ray to really determine whether this patient has a COVID infection or not. But our situation is different. We are not having a patient suffering from COVID, but we are having a patient who, in whom we want to rule out COVID. Nevertheless, chest X-ray could be a good screening test in our patients who may be having asymptomatic COVID and they may even be having asymptomatic lung disease. And chest X-ray could pick up these patients and we would be able to probably make sure that we don't operate on these patients. And this is also recommended as a preoperative test by the AIOS guideline. So, when it comes to OT scheduling, whenever we schedule any surgery or any patient who walks into the hospital, you know, we have to inform the reception to tell them that all the protocols they have to follow, they have to bring only one attendant. I think this has been stressed by all the speakers, including Mahesh. So, they have to wear a mask, a hand hygiene has to be followed and social distancing has to be followed. So, this is no different from patient who walks in to have a surgery done. And all the surgeries have to be taken only and therefore, we need to limit the number of surgeries because there is a recommendation that between the two surgeries, we need a time gap of 20 to 30 minutes for the OT air to get exchanged. I am sure Hemant will touch upon this in much more detail. But suffice it to say that we have to limit the number of surgeries so that also it avoids crowding in the wards. And at the same time, all the, ask the patient to come at different times, stagger the timing at which the patients report to the hospital. So this also avoids crowding in the ward, crowding in the cash counter, and crowding at the discharge place, etc. Entry point temperature has been stressed about, hand sanitization when the patient enters the hospital, encouraging digital payment, 
and allotting beds to keep social distancing. This is very important. If you have 10 beds, you may have to utilize only three or four beds to maintain social distancing and strictly insist on one attendant per patient and all of them to need to wear masks. The staff nurse in the ward needs to wear a cap, mask, and probably a shield, and they can minimize the exposure and putting drops like, you know, maintaining a distance like this and using dilating drops at home is a good way to reduce the interaction or the close contact between the staff and the patient. And always ensure that procedures like cannula insertion is done by the senior nurse. The idea is that minimum time is spent as close to the patient as possible. So most everything has to be done efficiently. I think this has been stressed very well by Raja and Mahesh that your efficiency, if it increases, then it decreases the duration of the patient's stay in the hospital. Again, once the operation is done, patient goes, and at the end of the day, when you leave, make sure that you dispose of all the waste generated in the proper way. The mask, the gloves, the cap, everything needs to be disposed of in an appropriate way. And even when we are giving post-operative instruction, it is very important to maintain social distancing. It may be a good idea to give handouts rather than giving verbal instructions lasting for more than 10 to 15 minutes. Instead of that, you can give out handouts and ask the patient to go through and call you if he has any doubt. Encourage the patient to phone in and clear his doubts, you know, instead of spending time close to the patient giving these instructions. And once the patient is discharged, it's important to clean the bed, the floor, the door handle, etc. And dispose of the, the whatever uh, you want. The patient was wearing the hospital dress. This has to be disinfected appropriately between each patient. And this is something that has to be really taken care of. Lastly, operating on a patient who is already having a COVID infection. I think this will be debated further. But as of now, only if a patient suffering from COVID infection he needs to be operated only if he has a real vision threatening emergency and it cannot wait for two to four weeks till the patient recovers. And obviously, it can be done only in a multi speciality hospital equipped to handle all COVID patients. So, definitely, most of the setups that we work in do not have this kind of uh, infrastructure, and therefore, we probably have to either refer these patients to the centers that have ability to handle these patients or we may have to defer the surgery till the patient recovers from his COVID infection. And of course, in these patients, GA should be avoided and aerosol generating procedures has to be avoided and this has been discussed in detail. So I think in short, most of us are not able to operate on a patient who is suffering from COVID who has any ocular emergency and probably are forced to refer him to a, another center which is equipped to handle this. So finally, take home message is that COVID scenario is likely to continue for indefinite period, friends. It's not going to end by end of May or end of June. So therefore, we need to institute and follow these protocols probably indefinitely. And therefore, it is better that all of us and all our staff, you know, get to know these protocols and get to learn them and it becomes a second habit. Therefore, the safety of all of them is guaranteed or at least you know, taken care of. And still remember, the basic premise is treat everyone as if he or she is COVID infected and then proceed. OT scheduling has to be done appropriately. Admissions have to be planned as per avoiding the social crowding. And special consent, I've already stressed about, needs to be taken. This is the most debatable issue here today will be the RT-PCR preoperatively for all. Whether we do it, how we do it, this is again a very gray area and this probably will end up spending a lot of time discussing this point. And please do not forget to maintain social distancing, hand hygiene at the ward also and institute proper protective equipment for all the staff, for all the duties, whatever they are doing. So these are all the challenges that we are facing now. And at, at the end of the day, efficiency improvement will definitely minimize the duration of the stay patient as in the hospital. Uh, probably we can train our patients to take appointments and come avoid walk-ins. Probably we can train our patients better. Ultimately, probably that is the good fallout of all this COVID you know, pandemic that has happened today. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you, sir, for that extensive talk. And I think it has clarified quite a few doubts that we all were having, especially regarding the RT-PCR. But some people have raised this question that uh, if they are having something in the CBC, the complete blood count, and in the chest X-ray, then they are referring the patients for doing an RT-PCR. What is your thoughts on that? Yes, I think that's a good uh, thing. You know, you don't do RT-PCR in everyone, but you do a chest X-ray and you do complete blood count. And like what Giridhar said, maybe you could do even a, a, a CR protein time. And that could CRP level, that could tell you at least a group of patients in whom you should insist on an RT-PCR. This is one point. So instead of doing it in all patients, you could restrict it to those patients in whom it is actually really necessary. RT-PCR may be negative in the initial incubation period when the patient is asymptomatic for at least three days. Yeah, so, sir, actually, is... yesterday, yesterday there was a webinar by AIOS and there was a doctor from Masai. Apparently, they were suggesting that you should do an RT-PCR two days prior to surgery in all the patients. Do you oh, really RT think that's an overkill? Uh, you should get a fresh RT-PCR just before surgery. Yeah. You know, uh, is... I, I, is there a consensus <laughs> that the X-ray chest has now become a routine part, whether it's a collision, cataract or any surgery? No. Is no. Anyway. Not an X-ray chest is not part of the routine workup. No, only for G. I used to get an X-ray chest done, so for, it's nothing new for me. I mean, I don't think it's addition. Let me add. A test coming out negative doesn't rule out COVID in that patient. So there's exactly. that's point. That's right. just what I mean. Because it's a very non-specific test. It will only uh, in those who have so symptoms, but again, the low prevalence of the infection at this point of time, less than 0.1% of our country is infected, even much lower. Even yeah. if you do a general test of 1000 patients of retinal detachment pre-op or whatever cataract patients pre-op, you are unlikely to get anyone as positive. And even if it comes negative, you cannot take it as negative, true negative, because if you subsequently do after three days or five days, it may come positive. If actually there is an infection so at this point of time these tests are not good for ruling out for ruling in you may they may still be better but for ruling out they are not good at all and never let your guard down that's a take home take home that even if a test is negative don't let your guard down you may be at risk so but can I just on the other hand anesthetists are refusing to take the patient even if the test is positive it doesn't mean patient is infective because it is hard PCR, it will pick up the dead bacilli also. So, you know, it's it's a big controversial test and uh, we have to take our stand depending whether we want to do it for every patient or not. Yeah. So, uh, there is something called a so what test for any, every investigation. When you do the investigation, you ask, so what if this test is positive or negative? So, let's ask this question. So, what if the test is negative? Will you walk into the OT only in your scrubs and a face mask like you do for any any other case before the CIRA? No. no. The answer is no. Therefore, your test becomes redundant. And I think no. that's obvious to everybody. No. Hey man, hey man, if the test is positive, yes, yes, that's no, for sure. Okay. I'm coming to operate that. on that patient. Isn't it? They, no. they will take on that patient. They will refer it somewhere. That's yeah. So, so, so the practice situation dictates when it becomes useful. <laughs> as private practitioners, you would have the, now the knowledge to refer this patient. So that's the only situation where it becomes Absolutely. a positive test, not a negative test. The other situation where it can become useful is a medical legal situation where the patient says, you gave me COVID, but here you have this certificate that the person was already COVID positive when he came to you. So then are we suggesting, uh, uh, Hemant, are we suggesting that then we should be doing an RT-PCR for all our surgery patients? Because if you have a positive test in hand, then as you rightly mentioned, that it's going to safeguard you from a medical legal case. And also, you are at that point which Raja has raised is well taken that you're not going to be decreasing your guard whether it's positive or negative. Correct. Correct. But, so, but how many how many PCR tests? Because if you are negative today, then to, yeah, you may be yeah, positive tomorrow. after five days also. So is one test so, that's also the next consecutive test. So, so negative PCR, the negative PCR does nothing for us. 
if you are testing to get the patient certified safe for surgery we are doing the wrong thing because it it means nothing it contributes nothing it changes nothing but the hospital and the clinician needs to decide whether they want to do it to be sure which patient to refer or not yeah that's each hospital's call that's true if the virus starts getting positive around 2 days before the actual infection starts manifesting even with mild symptoms so the important thing is that yes if you're going to take up the time to do it is probably within 24 as atul was saying around 24 hours before because you expect some symptoms to be there it makes no. more sense to do may just complete it makes more sense to do in a patient who has some symptoms than in a patient who has no symptoms but the biggest problem is that today the government has given there was a recent just today there was a news item saying you're not entitled to do this test in asymptomatic patients so you can't just order it as a routine and the last problem we are facing is the anesthetist refuses to take up the patient without getting a covid test for a negative i agree with everything himan said but the problem is how do i get the test done at least for showing that look i can take up this patient as far as the anesthetist is concerned so if you are doing a you are safe you don't need the anesthetist but if you are doing a ga you have a problem and then you have to defer to the wishes of the anesthetist because there is no way you can do the test without it. so the anesthetist should be teaching us how to interpret these tests actually because they are ones <laughs> who are at higher risk yeah See, as of today in karnataka we cannot order a pre surgery covid test because icmr does not permit unless the patient is willing to go to a private center and cough up 4500 rupees and wait for 24 hours for the test and i believe even the private labs the kits are supplied by icmr and they have to give the report and the reason to the icmr yes that is true and uh, you know so it's not it's not it's not possible for us to suggest that everybody should have a pcr test yeah so you're practical at this point of time something some symptoms are there so united states may be doing it Maybe so we can have this one. Yeah, this is, it's difficult to reach a consensus right now. But maybe we can just have a last word from all the panelists whether you would get an RT-PCR done if you are taking up a case for surgery or not. Dr. Vishali, let's start with you. At PJ, currently we are not doing it. If there is any problem, we get the clearance from our COVID medical team. Who? decide whether to do the test or not but all surgery patients currently as per our guidelines we are not doing pcr yes dr mesh we are not doing it for local patients but ga patients as dr murli mentioned or dr heman mentioned our anesthetists wanted it but then the, uh, the government institution refused to do it because icmr guideline is not there so that was good enough for the anesthetists to give ga So at the current moment, we are not doing it, and like Dr. Kumar said, we cannot do it also. Dr. Cyrus, we are not doing it routinely. And Dr. Shobit, what about you? Not routinely at all. Let the uh, physician decide who do the pre-op check. I think so. Let's move on to the next talk. I think uh, it's yeah. too early to reach a consensus right now. So maybe this can, can be taken up later. One point, uh, yeah. Manisha, about the daycare okay. issue. Sorry. Yes, sir. No, I just wanted to merely mention that all surgeries to be daycare. I, I, I really don't understand why there should be a sort of an edict on that it has to be daycare. After all, all other specialties do patients. They don't do day. Send them. I agree with you. I mean, say, let's say if it's a child undergoes GA. they need an overnight admission so the problem we face is that for hospital we have staff on rotation we may not have all the staff on you know uh, uh, all covered all the 24 hours so because we are working only limited hours we have staff only for about half the day or three fourths of the day so in that situation keeping the patient overnight poses some challenge to us and uh, if, if your hospital has staff round the clock no problem you can you need not have they they you can keep the patient overnight that's not an issue as long as at all the times the patient is in the hospital you have to follow all the you know social distancing all those protocols have to be followed all the time so oh, because the problem we find sometimes uh, if you have done a surgery especially a vr surgery and 
sometimes the neck there are a lot of problems in transportation and the patient sometimes you are afraid that the next day may not be able to come so it's uh, problems at border crossings ncr area and also in fact you are probably much more comfortable if you can see the patient the next day and then maybe even send him home for a more extended period so that way i suppose yeah yeah i agree with you tailor to every situation you have to make sure that you are able to provide the same protocol same Correct. conditions yeah. you know, as as long as the patient stays in the hospital absolutely sir that uh, may prove a little bit of burden to you in terms of staffing you know keeping the staff for the those night shifts evening shifts so that may be a challenge for you but if it's required you can definitely keep them overnight i have said that in the iios guideline preferred practice pattern it does mention that all surgery should be day care because patient exposure increases the longer you keep sure i think we can move on now uh, thank you again this is a very lively discussion i think we will we'll have to visit some of these points again it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, dr hemant tehan he uh, was a air commodore at the delhi army hospital alnar uh, division is the head of the department and uh, he'll be talking to us on working in the or uh good evening thank you brsi for asking me to speak on this um the aim is to di discuss the application of general guidelines that is general of health guidelines in retinal surgical practice it is not to discuss the ethics or suitability of protocols but how but how we implement this on ground Uh, i'm not an expert we have learned because of the experience of me and team members at ahrr whom i must acknowledge in this um this came about because we started wondering in the beginning of march that if we get a patient who is a child and who is covid positive and falls and injures his eye what do we do and how do we proceed and we straight away realized that that would not be a good time to start thinking at that point in time so we started doing these trials on what we should do am i audible yeah yeah very okay good. yes go so, ahead okay so the guidelines are delivered are derived mainly from the ios in the igo article but i firmly believe that your practice situation will dictate many parts of the protocol that we'll discuss and i am here to discuss the practical application so how does your practice situation affect this protocol if you are a stand alone ophthalmic ot your situation is very different from mine which is a multi specialty government hospital which may or may not cater for covid patients also if you have a single ot your situation is again different from mine which has multiple ot's not only ophthalmic ot's it also has multi specialty ot's it also depends upon what your ahu design is if your ahu is one per ot you have a different situation and if you are sharing ahus then you have a different situation and finally comes the economics and institutional philosophy which whether we like to admit it or not are going to drive most of the protocols in the end when they get implemented because money doesn't go on trees and institutional philosophy and a healthcare worker acceptance of these protocols also matters a lot into what will finally happen so let's walk through the ot and take a look as to what will happen so as you enter the ot comes the first point where your practice situation starts affecting things in an ot you are supposed to have a donning area a doffing area and a designated ot so all this stems from that initial uh, article initial paragraph which says please consider all patients and their attendants as covid positive or potentially infectious and that is the baseline for everything and i firmly believe in that because of the asymptomatic carriers and the poor sensitivity of the testing so as far as i am concerned whether i test or not every patient for me could be a covid positive patient and nothing changes my protective equipment posture except possibly the duration of what i'm going to do which is if i'm going to retinal surgery versus an intravitreal injection so if i have a single ot my donning area would be at the entry point the designated ot is already decided it's one ot doffing area is at the exit point and it is important to designate these areas most of us don't and i know that even at this stage we haven't got around to fully designating the doffing area but that will rapidly change the day a covid positive patient walks in multiple ot's all this is taken away from you for example for me 
the designated OT is by the anesthetist, not by me. And therefore, the donning area and doffing areas will also be common and they will be designated by the anesthetists. Now we scrub and change. The important point at this point is before scrubbing your hands, wear your N95 mask or whatever mask you'd like to wear and your shoe covers if you're going to wear. Because once you scrub, you can't touch any of these two things. So what's the deal with PPE? There's a huge amount of confusion about what is called PPE. Some people consider that PPE is only coveralls. So that's not true. And I would like to make it clear as to what is PPE. PPE includes all the components listed here and can be scaled up or scaled down as per your requirement. So it includes a surgical mask or an N95 or N99 mask. For my situation, I consider an N95 inescapable. I, there are boot covers, which we will discuss. Then there is fluid resistance or impermeable gown. Now, a gown is as much of a PPE as a coverall. And in fact, our whole uh, sort of our experiment or our trial runs were conducted just to know whether coverall can actually be worn because all of us considered coverall as PPE at that time for surgery or not. So I'd like to emphasize here that a gown is also as protective as is a coverall, provided you wear it along with the other paraphernalia that is supposed to be worn. However, for both of them, there are certification issues. They have to be of a certain grade and that information is available and they are scaled as levels one to four, depending on the, and that's available. These standards are available. Then come the face shields and goggles in, and we will discuss that too. So firstly about the shoe covers, ankle length or below are not okay and that's what the AIS says and the reason. So here is an ankle length shoe cover that I wore and you can see the minute I bend my knee, the ankle gets exposed. So it needs to go beyond the ankle, ideally up to mid calf or up to the knee. Why? Because if you are wearing a gown and your gown comes still here, the shoe cover should go above the lower edge of the gown. If your shoe cover is integrated with the coverall, that's fine. Basically the idea is to, to avoid exposure of skin so that even if there is some contaminated fluid contact, it doesn't serve as a fomite. So here was the experiment as to where can we wear coveralls safely for surgery. So at points you may be tempted to laugh, but that's okay. So the first thing you realize is that this is big. So there's too little space in our usual changing areas. So you may need to go into the main OT. If you do that, then you must do it only before the patient is wheeled in. Then when you try and wear it, you realize that you have to touch the outer surface because it's very difficult to wear by touching only the internal surface. And now you realize you're stuck. Why is this? Because you're trying to keep the cover all away from the floor and you're trying to wear it. And this is difficult. So you try, but your sleeve may be touching the floor and now you're stuck again. Why? Because you can't find the armhole and that's flapping around. And by now your assistants are laughing. But somehow you, with time, you get to wear it, right? At this point, you're not sure of the sterility. You're not sure whether it's touched anywhere or not. And you try and zip it up. And that's a potential area again, where you may touch your scrubs. Now, can you wash at this point? No, you can't because you'll splash water all over this PPE. So at this point, I realized that we should consider this coverall as possibly unsterile, right? So we decided at this point to wear a gown over it so that it becomes sterile. The other thing that bugged us was the hood. If it's not perfectly fitted, this is what happens. Sorry. So this is what happens if the hood is not perfectly fitted. And, but this can be improved by wearing uh, goggles and the goggles will push the hood back, even though it tends to keep coming onto you, right? And then again, it keeps doing this if it's loose. So as far as surgery itself is concerned, it's not so difficult. Uh, the only thing is there's a bit of heat stress. Uh, I was wearing a cheap pair of plastic uh, glasses through which I was able to do this surgery through a, through a scarred cornea. It wasn't a very long surgery, but I was still able to do it. So doing the surgery is not difficult. Now doffing, 
I want you to note the point that somebody had to release this gown tie from behind. So when you are wearing your gown, even if you are wearing just the gown, tie it on the side so that you don't need the assistant to touch it because this is then considered contaminated. So that's another little little point to be considered. And when you are removing it, make sure you don't touch the outside. Now the reason for double gloves. You should wear double gloves and note what happens when you remove the gown. This whole area gets exposed. So, although this was a COVID negative patient, whole epidemic really blew out and we were just doing trials, it really brought to the fore certain things about wearing a coverall. Gowns are easy to wear, we are all you know, quite adept at wearing them. So coveralls are not easy to wear sterile. If you want to wear it, uh, then you should wash, wear two pairs of gloves, get into the coveralls as far as possible in a sterile manner, remove the outer gloves, zip up, then remove the inner gloves, <coughs> use sterilium, and then wear a normal sterile glove and double, uh, gown and double glove on top. Look out for the hood. I've already explained this. Also look at this exposed area. This is what happens when you don't have a good fitting hood. So you can use an external hood or you can use a surgical balaclava. Face shields are difficult for surgery and they, they just don't work. So goggles are the best and I was wearing a cheap pair, you get better pairs and uh, try and have a side seal to them and they seem to work well. Do the glasses obstruct? No. <coughs> what about air conditioning? Air gu uh, guidelines say air handling units should have increased pressure exchange. This is easy to do. Uh, you can go from an 80-20 fresh and recirculation to a 50-50 also if you want. And the second one says stop ventilation if feasible and for 20 minutes after the patient has left the theater. How do you stop positive pressure ventilation or positive ventilation at the theater? It is not possible to switch it off selectively. If you switch off positive pressure, you have to switch off the fan which stops the air conditioning, which stops the air circulation and only your exhaust is working. So there is no cooling. There's no pressure. So it, it really builds up uh, the microbes in your environment and it also builds up the heat stress. So if you have a positive pressure OT, what is important? Now, this is one guideline. There's a reason why this positive pressure thing has been mentioned because it's part of the Indian Society of Anesthetists guidelines. But if you read a large number of guidelines, most of them say that critical times to switch off air conditioning are only when you're opening and closing doors because that creates turbulence and the dust and everything gets aerosolized. <coughs> so that is the time to switch off your AC when you're wheeling in and out patients. Also, when you finish your case, you must keep the AC on and in fact, increase the number of air cycles that are going on so that the contained air of that patient is totally recirculated, is totally removed and fresh air has replaced it. From what we hear elsewhere, most surgeons have not converted to negative pressure OTs. But is it possible to convert to a negative pressure OT if you want? Yes, it's possible. So I spoke to our AHU man and he said, yes, there's, it's possible to do this. You can put dampers, you can put an extra exhaust. Uh, but the important part is if you are exhausting from a separate source now, that source need to be, needs to be covered by an HEPA filter. You cannot just vent out that unfiltered air. There needs to be a HEPA filter, possibly UV light at that exit. And it needs to exit 50 feet away from any air intake. You can also open the supply air duct so that extra pressure goes out. You can alter the fan speeds and change the pulleys which decreases the power of the fan. These are not difficult to achieve, but there are solutions only for the short term. Doing a real negative pressure isolation room kind of thing requires extensive engineering, but you can do these short term solutions. They are not possible to validate and it does alter, alter the airflow patterns in the OT. So this is a call that you need to take depending upon where you're practicing. What changes for the patient? He needs to wear a surgical mask. Uh, it decreases the risk if the patient coughs. It also decreases fogging, thankfully. And there are certain strategies to make the patient feel more comfortable, which I've listed. You use large drapes because you want fluid fill not, uh, spill not to be there. And it will protect your feet and the foot switch. How does the surgical procedure change? Not really, but there are certain times of concern that I have thought about 
where I really don't know what the risk is, but these are times of concern. And that is because of the non valve cannulas with VGFI systems, where we've all seen this gush of fluid that comes out under when you have pressurized fluid and you remove the instruments. It doesn't happen that much with the gravity field. It doesn't happen that much at all, actually, when you have a, a valve cannula. Second point is bubbling during fluid air exchange. That can happen. I don't know how much of a risk it is, but it's fairly significant at times. Spill of fluid onto the feet and the foot switch. We've already discussed that strategies to uh, combat that. And most of these are taken care of by the valve cannula. There are some concerns about diathermy, but in our case, the diathermy usually takes place in an enclosed chamber. And therefore, the risk is low. Sometimes lasers cause smoke in the uh, vitreous cavity. Uh, I don't know how significant the risk is in that. Uh, again, valves are an advantage here. When you're doing external diathermy, let's say you're doing a conjunctival incision or you're doing an SFI oil or something, then again, now the risk of aerosolization is very significant. So at these times you can use a, uh, a suction cannula, a general suction cannula that everybody uses and keep that suction on to take away the uh, smoke and the aerosols that are connect connected. How does the consumable situation change? So if you are really operating and considering that this is a COVID positive patient or potentially called COVID positive, then anything in the OT that is lying outside could be considered contaminated, even if you haven't opened it. So if you've got a spare pair of, spare pair of instruments, spare suture lying around, then even though it hasn't been opened, its surface is contaminated. So you need to keep a good balance between need and excess. And how do we recycle these unopened spares? Definitely you have to wipe it down. Do you need to re-ETO it? I'm not sure we can debate it. How does instrumentation change? A lot of your equipment is going to go into disuse because you may be running one OT when you used to be running three. You may be doing less cases. Your rest of the machines are redundant. You cannot do simultaneous cases. So you are going to need to take care of this because these machines need to be switched on and off and you'll have to have a servicing program in place. Expendables are going to expire because your volumes are going to go down. And this includes IOLs. This is the place where VRSI can possibly step in and be the interface between us and industry because they say it's expired, we can't change it. So this is an abnormal situation where we will have to come to some sort of meeting ground. Resupply. Now we've given indents and supply orders for various things which the suppliers just can't supply. And we can't penalize them because they invoke the force measure clause in which when there are calamities, they cannot be blamed for any delay in supply. And there are situations where people will run out of things because their, their global supply chain are just not ready to supply them. And they are broken down, which is another great reason actually to go Indian. So you end up with this seesaw procurement where sometimes you have excess and things expiring and then you have stock out situations. So now it's time to leave the OT after your case. And it's very important to go through the doffing procedure. This is usually a problem as it needs to be outside the OT. You can't do it in the OT because your OT is already contaminated and you need to be outside. You must have a dedicated room. You should obey the doffing sequence. There are enough videos on it. Remove, start removing PP only after you have disinfected the outer gloves with sterilium or any alcohol based drug. And then remove N95 only after cleaning the inner gloves. These are just basic principles. How do we manage PP procurement depends on the guidelines. It depends on institutional imperatives. And the CDC has a very nice way of doing it in which they say, okay, if we have enough or standard strategies or conventional strategies, then we will go on this manner. And these are the people who will get this much. If you have less, then this is contingency. And if everything is over and we are swamped, then that is called crisis strategy. So it may be a good idea for all institutions to develop these three strategies. But this is not an escape valve for not starting at the con conventional level. We have not, none of us have reached the level where we are swamped or uh, uh, we've hardly actually consumed our items. So we should be starting at the conventional capacity. What does this mean for our OT lists? Camps, long lists with multiple tables, finishing early, going home, low cost, these are all out of the window now. In conclusion, one patient per OT, designate doffing and donning areas, Non-permeable gowns are adequate body protection and are part of PPE designated by CDC, but boot covers need to be beyond, beyond the lower end of the gown. Coveralls are difficult to wear sterile. Either have a washed up assistant to help 
or wear a gown over it. Final configuration of PPE will depend on the practice situation, practice situation and very importantly, the acceptance and security level of the healthcare worker. The institution may say anything, the healthcare worker has to accept it. He has to feel secure in it. And that is a very difficult thing to marry up. Do a mock trial. Lot of small things will crop up. Even if you don't have a surgeon, uh, surgery, wash up, wear whatever you need to wash up and run through a mock surgery. You'll, you'll be amazed at the number of things that develop. OTA conditioning will need to be sorted out on a pragmatic facility-based approach depending on what's possible. Switching off air conditioning is for the duration of surgery. I don't think it's a practical approach in our country. We have tried it. It was amazing heat stress. It's just impossible to do for VR. AOS guidelines are very smartly worded and they need to be understood. They say if possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hemant. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, your yeah. videos, uh, you went into the finer aspects. They may have seemed funny, but uh, I think these are the fine things that we need to, you know, stress and uh, you, uh, I mean, you left nothing to imagination, really. I think it's important that uh, many of the finer points that you brought out, uh, we kind of adhere to that. And uh, there are a lot of questions which have come in. One particular thing is, I mean, uh, do we need to change the cassette for every case? And also about the uh, question of change in sterilization techniques uh, for instruments couple of questions which you'd like to respond to. First question about cassettes. See, the, uh, the virus is not a particularly hard, hardy virus. It, it is susceptible to whatever every, every other virus or bacteria is susceptible to. Uh, so I, if you are ETOing your cassettes between cases and that is your practice, uh, I don't think the virus will survive an ETO. They've done tests on it and uh, it is very much susceptible to ETO. The, the issue is that if you're reusing the same cassette for the next case without ETOing it, then there's an issue because you may be refluxing, um, then, then you're potentially contaminating patients. Okay. And then, for sterilization, I don't think you would change any practice. Okay. And then another question, an interesting question. Uh, what if you're from a, uh, from a smaller setup? We have a situation where we have one OT with a lamellar flow and another with a routine OT. Would it be safer? to do it in the routine OT, which is just a split AC. Oh, split ACs are actually more dangerous because they don't have the operate, uh, they don't have a great option for recirculating fresh air. A mixing option for fresh air. I know there is a small vent which can be done, but it's not controlled. Um, so split ACs are a little difficult unless you can really control your uh, external air mixing. Whereas with an AHU, that can be done. Yeah. I think you made very uh, good points about uh, the degree of PP. That's going to be a point of contention. I think for everybody, you know, procurement is going to be difficult. I think those, uh, the CDC guidelines, which you alluded to, I think uh, those also need to be seen. I think everybody really needs to look at that and see how best they can protect themselves as well as their patients. And of course, like you mentioned uh, very correctly, it should not be used as a, safety well mechanism by admins to not uh, bring in the safest or the best possible uh, protection that both the surgeon, the healthcare workers, as well as the patient require. Uh, any comments on that from uh, Dr. Atul, Dr. Vishali uh, from institutes, as well as Dr. Cyrus uh, and Dr. Giridhar? I'd like the panel to Very nice take talk. this question. Hey, Heman. I don't know whether we really require these uh, IVAC suits uh, for VR surgery at this stage. Because I feel a splash proof or a little waterproof gowns you have these available from many Indian uh, you know, companies. You, and you wear your gloves, you wear your gowns. Essentially the same thing. Only thing you wear an N95 probably and the patient wears a mask. And you've got a drapes over it. And of course, I don't think we need to change much. I would just uh, boot covers, sir. Maybe just boot covers um, if you feel the necessity. But there's no bloodborne spread. Yeah, but intraocular fluid could spell, spill uh, on you, so that is the only logic. Right. Uh, and I agree with you totally, and I emphasize that coveralls are. Uh, this was an experiment to see whether you can actually wear coveralls. It's not a great option. Gowns are totally um, satisfactory if you need to wear them. We've given face shields to our anesthetists because uh, this intubation and all these suction which they do are aerosol generating procedures. 
unfortunately the none of the chronic diseases including phaco don't generate aerosol as of now that's lucky for vr we don't have any aerosol generating so there is another question which came up uh, about aerosol generating procedures in uh, the vr uh, scenario i think yesterday's uh, webinar also dr james tadosh uh, mentioned that uh, probably in vr there aren't that many uh, aerosol generating procedures but again the jury is out there we really do not know for sure so uh, so can i say something yeah please okay so that that is what i mentioned in my talk that the only situations where i thought there is a potential for exposure is one if you are using a non wet candle and you have vgfi and you remove your candle uh, instruments that's the time where on the fluid is on you and we all had that happen so if that fluid gets into your conjunctiva or on your surfaces that's a problem it may not be aerosolization but it's intraocular fluid uh, the other place is a fluid air exchange again there's a lot of bubbling we all had that at the fruit needle or at the cannula tip i don't know what the risk uh, factor is but it's a lot of bubbling and that's aerosolized i think we are overdoing this because the first thing you must understand is that the conjunctiva has a very low load of uh, the virus even when it gets infected the just to give you an idea the the difference between the load in the um, sputum is something sputum is something like something into 10 to the power 3 so it could be 4000 5000 in the per, per ml in the conjunctiva the usual load which has been found is something like 150 and 60 uh, virus copies per ml so first of all the load is very little secondly it is usually uh, the when you put the beta dean the beta dean virtually destroys the uh, the, the virus immediately three there is no virus inside the eye it is an it is a mucous membrane virus so what happens is now even if fluid is coming out during the vitrectomy process it's actually washing up if at all even those 10 copies to 15 copies are created because of something being within the conjunctiva which will mean you will be having conjunctivitis now you will obviously not be operating patients with conjunctivitis now even if let's assume for a moment that there is going to be some degree of aerosolization it is immediately next to the eye it is not sufficient to actually come on with the patient with his mask and with you with your mask with the and staying at a height above this is uh, likely to be irrelevant in terms of infection to you so actually i think you know and it's very important we sort of uh, de uh, mystify this whole thing and we not only justify but also remove the fear i am a little worried that i am going to sound like a rambo at the end of my talk because everybody here seems to be scaring the hell out of everybody who's listening and i think we are going a little wrong on this because the basic principle and i made a blog on this you need to create a chakra view a chakra view of protection for you and your patient you cannot remove the virus from the atmosphere it's going to be there you have to ensure that you don't get into trouble because of this virus and your patient doesn't get into trouble because of the virus so even if there is now if there so that's why i said if there is frank covid the patient goes to atul i don't want to look at him right if the patient doesn't have covid then we may may not there's a 2% chance i will take all the precautions called the universal precautions and those are enough the only addition thing which i am willing to listen to is the boot cover and in addition to your normal gown you put a, you can have a sterile or unsterile plastic sheet those come 50 rupees not the 1000 bucks you'll spend on this hazmat suit which can be put and that covers the entire body area for you these are the two things and one last thing just occurred to me we could modify our gowns the cloth gowns to have a little bit of a uh, uh, cover for the neck and that would take care of everything for the future so this is my uh, one suggestion. last comment by hemant to that point and then we'll move uh, on so i don't know if i'll be comfortable with recommending cloth gowns they have no level of protection as far as uh, uh, fluid protection is concerned that from the plus we can uh, the fiber gowns that's to be impermeable and and i please don't i i just 
don't misunderstand me and i have been trying to say this repeatedly i am not saying you should be wearing coveralls the video was to show how difficult coveralls are to wear you in a sterile manner everybody you said right. a lot of thousand people for whoever how is listening no, i think I, i i emphasized it thrice in my talk that yeah. this was because everybody equates ppe with coveralls right and i am trying to make the point that that is not true gowns are good protection and coveralls are really difficult to wear in a sterile manner you'll end up having to wear a gown on top if that is all you have and you have that configuration then this is how to do it but gowns are enough and i've said that like i think five times in this presentation yeah, so the point the the point i agree with you uh, the point i was asked was where during the vr procedure could you possibly envisage an exposure occurring and these were the points i agree with you the risk is low but these are the possible points otherwise i don't find any other point in the vr procedure sure. where this so i agree and points well taken uh, himant i think we'll move on manisha can you uh... yeah so let's move on i think this is a uh, never ending topic for all of us so the last talk is by dr dinesh talwar he's a senior vr uh, surgeon from center for sight and we have been talking a lot about double gowns and double gloves but i think there is a cost uh, attached to each and every precaution that we are taking in our clinics so we have to strike a balance between the cost and being cautious so dr talwar please thank you manisha in these last 2 hours i have actually got scared i used to think that i am cautious but it seems to me i'm going to be i'm going to appear like a rambo as i said and that is because i think maybe we may be going overboard on a lot of these things mm. i'm unable to go into the slide show yeah okay i agree we live in a changed world we have new norms of acceptable behavior and these will be both during the lockdown and keep it in mind post lockdown too but these fears there are rational ones and some irrational ones it's important for us to understand and differentiate what are the critical changes we need to do which are imperative which are important which are not so critical but good if we do it and what are luxuries which maybe only a few would be able to afford there is definitely a continuous lurking risk of transmission of a contagion to both patients and healthcare workers and this is regardless of the area where work where we are whether it's red orange or the green zone though the intensity of this risk may vary there is a need to take precautions to prevent this infection not only because a you may get sealed for some time but worse you may end up with one positive case causing a cascading effect on the availability of health workers to run your entire facility because they all get quarantined because of this we need to take precautions with regards to the procedure for registration opd opd procedures surgical procedures all of which you heard from the speakers before this but there is another thing the patients may because of the fear among them limit their hospital visits themselves and they may even look to shift their consultations to people who are nearer to them even if they are not as satisfied the other important thing is now when we talk about cost you have to talk about revenue and you have to talk about the uh, the expenditures so revenue can go down because of the number of patients and that can be because of this atmosphere of fear and uncertainty but it can also be because of the reduced financial resources of the population they don't have the money to pay for you and lastly and which is what seems to be coming up a decreased capacity of the healthcare institutions to deal with patients without crowding which is the new norm but this we will deal with again and the second thing is of course the increased expenditure on this new set of operating procedures so let's talk about this decreased capacity i believe there is a simple solution and we've discussed it you can increase your clinic timings and compensate for the decrease in number and as raja said you can increase your efficiency so you can increase with that by automating you can increase that by redesigning patient flow systems pre registration can be um, online you could have pre payment uh, also online and uh, before uh, before the patient comes and during the process when he's sitting with you and he's decided you need some investigations 
the there can be uh, wireless uh, systems for free, for him to make the payment online also he doesn't need to run back and forth and you don't need to crowd any area the important thing is that there is a new normal which is during the lockdown period and then there will be another log normal for the post lockdown period now in the lockdown period we have to have this triad so that we can figure out which patient really needs to be seen and what is not an emergency but after that is done we also then need to ensure um, dr mahesh already talked about that the patients and the relatives need to have the masks and everything now how much does that cost think about it i was seeing the cost of micro shield which is the most expensive hand drop in the market even that is 16 rupees per patient and his for his attendant now if you come to the post lockdown period in the post lockdown period you won't need the triage but you still need to have the pre registration done you should get the declaration done you should have the willingness to consult and he history of contact all those things can be done in the facility that you created for your triage and then the rest of the same the the, the procedure remains the same and after you've done that uh um, i would suggest that we do use this arogya setu uh, app it seems to be a good thing and the main thing the main essential factor how you do it is your problem all patients to maintain social distancing at all time this is mandatory and for that you need additional space requirements or you decrease the number of patients per hour and increase the working hours the next important thing is the additional efforts for disinfection and there is a cost here but where is the cost most of the cost is well you can say bacillus acid is ex is expensive but sodium hypochlorite is not right. and this can be used for all the formites and it's effective whether it's right that number huh? room surfaces etc etc the the lab operators now the important thing is that all health workers and residents make sure to clean all everything that they use and one thing avoid direct or thermoscopy the only important thing is that because of this cumbersome attire the mask the other precautions the goggles your patients will not get a rapo with you and that's why you need to spend some time otherwise you may end up with more litigation later on because the patient doesn't connect with you and that is something we must not forget as far as the precautions are concerned they've already been talked about i'm not going to talk about them again but what about the cost involved i calculated if you consider the cost of sanitizer cleaning even the cleaning person additional would you take for and his salaries and all i think the total cost is not more than 90 rupees per patient so maybe 150 rupees to keep yourself new, revenue neutral but definitely not your face shields are available from 75 rupees to 200 rupees goggles are easily available and these are long lasting items this is commercially available cost 200 rupees very effective i have given this to people and this has very good transparency this is plexiglass so i have given it to my uh, optometrist but the rest of them have this kind of shield um, if they want to use it which is which has a little effect on vision this is actually just a gown this is you don't need a hazmat suit to see your patients but the but these barriers definitely are important non contact tonometry again we will not discuss here because there is a controversy in this and i don't want to bring it up now but the basic efforts are needed to decrease the virus load on formites to prevent accidental picking up virus from them also to prevent further spread on some formites which comes from the people who are there coughing sneezing or even loud talking and lastly to prevent spread of aerosol from asymptomatic carriers so now to in a normal opd normal center the ones who have covid positive or already have massive significant symptoms i would say let them go to a covid center the rest are patients whom we can carry on with most opds the only important thing is be cautious make lifestyle changes change into surgical scrub suits when you enter the hospital and leave them when you get out of the hospital the important thing is don't crowd at any point of time and that's what is the most i mean i can repeat that many times now 
Other than that, the basic precautions have been discussed and you continue them. Consider that everybody can contaminate you. So you don't take a chance on that. Daycare surgery is only to limit the amount of exposure, the duration of exposure. But if you follow all universal precautions and the new thing, which ophthalmologists are not used to, give a 20 minute timeout between surgery during which you call carry out complete disinfection of the OT after each surgical case. And believe me, this is the protocol for Apollo. I'm not allowed to do a second case, even if it's an injection, unless they've cleaned the OT. Keep in mind, as far as surgery is concerned, except where you're talking of GA, where there is aerosol generation, I am not sure how much is the risk from the aerosols which we are generating in our procedures. There is minimal possibility of virus in tears. Even in COVID positive cases, only something like three out of 52 patients turned out to be positive. The minimal load is there and sterilization of the uh, conjunctival uh, surface with betadine will take care of whatever is residue. So you are only trying to prevent the breath from contaminating you. The surgical guidelines based on general surgery, I don't think many of them are applicable to ophthalmology because as it is, I said, no proven cases, which we will do except in designated cases, uh, designated hospitals. Surgery is under local anesthesia. Only site of contamination after draping, and you are doing extensive draping, is the conjunctiva. No proven case so far of a conjunctiva to human transmission. And if you want to discuss that, I'll give you the reason for that again. I've already talked about the virus load. The betadine sterilization is effective and the aerosolization is minimal. As far as indications are concerned, I'm now to, to come to the fact that I don't believe we should say emergent. Emergent means abhi garo. So I don't believe it's emergent. I believe we should say emergent means where we believe the intervention should be within the next one or two weeks. Urgent is when we believe the intervention should be somewhere between two to six weeks. So that gives you time. And non-emergent is when you say, well, even the next six to 12 weeks is not a problem. So I'm not saying that you don't need to see those patients, but you can delay the patients. You have a dry air MD, you can delay the patient. You have to give an intravitreal. It's important you did give it within a week or 10 days. Don't try to delay that. You need to do a, a laser for an HRC um, case of uh, diabetic. Uh, do it. Don't 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 delay that. But try to extend the intervals where intravitreal injections are concerned. So plan ahead. You give so instead of giving ranibizumab, might give ilia and say, okay, carry on for two months instead of one. Post lockdown, the same guidelines can be used for prioritization. And this is especially important for high load centers and to prevent overcrowding. It doesn't mean that the patient... Now, you know, this is Jugar at its extremes. We don't need to go there. But these are possible. But even this is not necessary. This may be for 30 rupees. An inexpensive shield properly made in a factory is available from 75 to 200 rupees. What's the problem? If you have the luxury of an office, protect that area with glass partitions. So these are all things which are available. You want to reuse a mask. You know what I do when I go to work, I put a double mask. I come back in the car. The car is parked outside in the sun. It's going to stay there for 24 hours. I leave the mask over there. Now, uh, well, that's an un, um, the report is not yet uh, published, but the uh, report already from USA says that they found that sunlight inactivates the virus quickly. Somebody told me, well, no, that's not important. Drying does. So big deal. The drying and uh, the, the sun, if there's good enough sunlight, it will dry as well as it will. The sunlight will work. You will be able to, disp uh, to reuse most of your masks and your N95 masks. With otherwise, you will be spending a lot of money on buying N95 masks. And this is uh, what Hemant uh, agreed with. If you have an N95 and you wear another mask on top of it, you can dispose the disposal mask, your N95 can stay on. As far as the issue of high quality optics of various machine concerned, I just want to talk one, I want to cut this Gordian knot. I have never seen an OCT optic being contaminated because of, because of, a, because of a direct touch by either me or by my patient. 
So the only thing that's left is the breath, which may contaminate him. That is also minimized by the use of a mask. Number one. Number two, we are not going to touch these surfaces. At the end of each shift, you can use 95% isopropyl alcohol, which is safe and effective for high quality optics. And you, you've got a sterilized system. You don't need to put these covers and all, which are, which will look cumbersome, though yes, if, the, if you find them effective and you find them very easy to do, they can be done. So I'm just giving an alternative. Once a day, you can, you can clean everything with 95% isopropyl alcohol and that can take care of this. PPE, when I said I was talking about the hazmat suit, so I think everyone agrees that's not necessary. If you have a window air conditioner, there isn't really any issue. You can, you can have a fresh air mode or, um, and if you open the window, you'll be able to get the fresh air or you can get the fresh air mode of the AC. Um, if you have an AHU, great. The last thing, the crux of everything that I've said is, Social distancing in the OPD and OT by staggered appointments, no walk-ins, increased dinner timings, shortened duration, duration times, and thus examination times, frequent hand sanitizer use for doctors, HCWs, and patients, and there are economical forms of those available, frequent disinfection of all formats, which are fairly inexpensive, and PPEs all the time, not, not hazmat suits, but the PPEs as, we, as we've de defined. The new normal is a world in which we need to slow our pace, work longer, and with more caution, but not fear. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir, for that detailed assessment of the cost involved at every step. I have a few questions, and maybe I can have a quick comment from Jahan also. There is a suggestion that to save the cost, if we can reuse the overall that we wear in the OT and just keep putting on a sterile gown over it for the various surgeries, is that doable? May I answer? Or you want Trehan first? No. no, you can answer, sir. Maybe Trehan can go on next. Okay. See, what I said was, you know, and we use this for patients who have uh, hepatitis B and all, you can use a plastic overall that comes after you over your scrubs, that is waterproof. Over that, you wear a sterile gown. Now, and you, the only concern that people had was that water can go through a cloth gown. But you have a sterile, you have a plastic gown, a plastic overall under that. Therefore, you are not going to get wet from any fluid that may leak through into the gown or um, and even go through the gown. So that is the cheapest thing you can have because that plastic um, um, overall doesn't cost more than 100 rupees. And that can be the routine for us. Rather than using it once in a while, use that as a routine. Rehan, any comment from you? Um, I would say change them. You don't need to be wearing a coverall and on top of that a gown. That is a strategy to um, sort of adjust with the limitations of what you have. Right. Some people may not have the gown that's needed. Some people may have only the coverall. So these are ways to adjust. Uh, even a gown is just enough. And I would suggest you change your gown uh, between cases because you're going to wait 20 minutes after your case ends. And this gown is now contaminated by the exterior in the exterior and because of the last patient. And so you have to change the outer bit. So if you're going to change the gown, then wear only the gown. Why do you need to wear the coverall? If so there is a, the only point I was making was if you're, if you're already, if you factored in disposable gowns into your costs in the hospital, it doesn't matter. If you haven't factored them in, and this is an additional cost to auto, right, then the cloth gown with a, overall, uh, with a coverall can, uh, can save you the cost. There is no question. You have to change the gown and the coverall at the end of each surgery. So As I, of now, we are already uh, changing the uh, washing again, changing our gowns, gloves, everything. After each correct. we are hungry. Absolutely right, sir. Same for Absolutely. memorial at RPC. Hemant, you it's said... It's not very difficult. You said you could use one N95 throughout the day on operating. What about your coffee in between the cases? <laughs> then you have to change it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Vishali, if you want to have coffee, you, need two of them, you keep the first one into a, a, a box 
and then you can put it over there or you can keep four. They've actually recommended four. Keep four of them, keep them in different boxes and rotate them every four days. The brown bag even is not. Yeah. So you have to change them every four days. The important thing is then you will, uh, you will use the same number over time, but you will need more than one mask. In fact, that is why in my car, I've kept two of them. So the, I can go the next day with a new one if I, if I, uh, and then put the, uh, let it stay in the sun for 48 hours and then use it. In US, they're sterilizing uh, 75 degree for 30 minutes and 95 and read. That's been years because I've done quite a bit of reading on this. Um, and what I realized was that if you are air sterilizing or sort of duration time sterilizing your or decontaminating your mask, it needs about four to five days. Uh, the other options all work. The other, so the CDC has a very nice website. So does the, um, and I think uh, I have the, I can show it if you want, uh, where it has mentioned all the ways of decontaminating your mask. They start with the highest priority, which has been given a US FDA emergency authorization, which is hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is by two ways. One is uh, the stir rad that many of our hospital has. Have I'm sure PGI has it. I'm sure Ames has it. We have it. And uh, that has been certified for um, decontaminating N95 masks. Correct, sir. So the important thing to know about sterilizing N95 masks is that you need to know the construction of an N95 mask. So once you realize that the construction is heat sensitive and chemical sensitive, then you realize what is appropriate. So hydrogen peroxide has been tested and found the fit doesn't change and the filtering capacity doesn't change, right? So, and it's certified safe. Italy, uh, so ETO also works, but the problem is the degassing. So there's nothing wrong with the decontamination, so but I the mean, problem is degassing. Uh, so that's why uh, Himant, I was giving you a little cost-effective method. If you have a normal disposable mask, doesn't cost only 15, 20 rupees. And under that, you have the N95. You dispose of the disposable one. The one N95 hour. goes into sunlight for the next 24 hours. Sunlight. Yes, sir. I think that point is well taken. I think that point is well taken. We can save the cost of repeatedly changing the N95 mask. Another question being raised is we, uh, we raised this question of unused consumables in the OT. Is formalin chamber an option for, you know, saving or, you know, sterilizing those unused consumables in the OT in such a situation? I don't think so. So may I give you a simpler technique than that? You double pack your, your stuff for uh, when you ETO. If something has not been used, you only need to clean it with the hand sanitizer and keep it back because that's enough to wipe out the virus from the surface. That little bit of virus, which has in a patient, uh, situation where everybody is wearing a mask, patient is wearing a mask, staff is wearing a mask, little bit of virus came into that OT it landed onto the surface of the, uh, of the uh, unused material, which is double packed. Just clean it with a hand sanitizer and put it back. You don't need to do anything else. There's another question, sir, regarding the sterilization or safeguarding your OCT lens. You said that you can clean it up with the isopropyl alcohol. Yes, so I Dr. went Dr. to- Dr. Shanmugam showed the cling film method. So I just wanted a comment from both of you regarding this, that which is a safer option. Uh, is Dr. Mahesh speaking first? Yeah, Dr. Mahesh. Sure. Yeah, that 95% uh, alcohol. And in fact, our biomedical engineer also suggested using this on even the 2D lenses. Problem is, you spray it, he said you can leave it in place. But it, he says he said that it would not leave dots. But then you spray it and leave it in place to dry, it does leave dots. So you still have to wipe it. So any process of wiping can ultimately damage the lens. And like, and the... Yes, OCT, whether you want to cover it or not is a different question, but in the proximity made me think that to look for another solution. So you can wipe it with the 95% isopropyl alcohol, but then like still you may still have to wipe it. So to avoid that, I put this cling sheet, which you can wipe it. Only disadvantage of the cling sheet is you don't get the color photograph. You get the OCT as good as any other OCT. So the safe solution is 50% alcohol and 50% uh, ether. Make sure that is a for all optics, so with the of high-grade optics, but I don't know if 50% alcohol 
will be effective against the virus. Okay, no, no. So with the high, the high quality optics as advised by, uh, you know, on um, um, by the manufacturers, two methods are used. One is a combination of 40% methanol with acetone. And the second is 95% ethyl alcohol. Uh, as Dr. Mahesh said, yes, there is a possibility of some uh, dots coming with 95% alcohol, but with very little as compared to with 70% alcohol. So 70% alcohol is not advisable. 95% is. And the other thing, which could be, I was just thinking, a even safer solution, you, you use the 95% alcohol for 30 seconds. It kills off all the viruses. And then you can use the conventional optic cleaner, that is, uh, the the methanol with acetone and and complete the process uh, which does not cause or the lens wipes or the lens wipes the normal lenses wipes which we use so there the the risk of your damaging your optics will will be the same as you have today i mean once in a while you're cleaning it even today you need to do the same thing and 95 percent alcohol will 100 percent take care of all virus load the important thing is i want to sort of remove the fear involved in working in this era. So I want to be as close to what I do normally. I don't want to have to uh, make, you know, like that, uh, there was one photograph of uh, everything covered with plastic and all. The main thing is fear. We are going to start living in an atmosphere of fear. We don't need to do that. That's the whole point. Session. So Thank you, sir. I think it's like redefining a new normal again, as we've all been saying. We've had uh, very great uh, thought-provoking talks today. And I think if not anything else, at least we can start thinking about it and come up with new ideas, what works the best in our hands. So I will just conclude this session and hand it over to Dr. Cyrus Shroff for, some, for his concluding remarks. Thank you so much for all the great talks. Thank you, Manisha. And thanks, Anand, for a very lively uh, seminar and webinar. And I thank VRSI2 for organizing this as second in the series of the webinars. And let me thank and congratulate all the speakers for uh, very wonderful presentations and, and excellent points on their particular topics of on what, what they spoke on. And I think there's a lot of food for thought for all of us. And it's important, I think, for us. I, I don't think there were any prophets of doom, nor, there were, nor were you a Rambo, Dinesh. So I think it's important for us to be all alert and take all precautions uh, possible. But we also have, as Dinesh said, I think we need to not be living in a state of fear. We have to learn to live with this virus. It's going to be around for quite some time. It's not going to go away in a hurry. So we do look forward, I'm sure, with passage of time, there will be some drugs which may be more effective. Ultimately, a vaccine will come up. And uh, I think all said and done, there's no 100% protection, either for any health care or for the patient. It's, that's not possible. And we have to remember that we, many of us have gone through other situations like dengue and, and swine flu and, and similar things. So I think this time will also pass. In the way we, many people say that and work and enjoy will completely change and, and the world will be altered forever. I don't feel so. And there will be changes and, and possibly some good ones. We learn some good habits, hopefully, for the future. But I think ultimately the human tendency to be, as we are social beings and, and gregarious beings, and I think ultimately that will prevail. And, uh, and, and sometime later, we will find the new normal, which hopefully will not be such a grim world either. So I think with that, I think we can should hopefully look to a good and, and a positive future. The, all of you do take good care and, and stay safe and well.